Starting off with a suggestion by Crimson Soul on Reddit, we have something that might be the quintessential mini mysteries video. It's a video amusingly titled Red Wagon Pistachio Avery Secret Jersey Dance Laugh, and as much of a word soup that title is, the content is a bit stranger. It's a five minute long video where most of the content is just nothing. Literally nothing. No audio, no visual, nothing. Until, of course, some time goes by and you get something like this. Now it can't show you every single clip in the video, because as blurred out as it is, the video itself is very promiscuous in nature, specifically the parts where you can very clearly see a woman's breasts uh, jiggling. I'm not really sure what it all means, and frankly I can't even figure out why the name of the channel is called Punish Babies. Maybe there's some commentary here about contraception, maybe something a bit more esoteric, but hell, I don't really know. It all does seem pretty freaky, honestly. I mean, it's one thing to have a sort of art house experimental video project that very clearly conveys a message, even if the message isn't very clear, but the obscurity of this video is really what sets me off. I mean, it only has 65 views, and with a name like this, you're not really gonna find many people. Maybe it's a code, or maybe it has something to do with the content shown? Maybe it really is an art house film, and some sort of experimental college project, I'm not sure. Well, whatever the case may be, I think this video is both very creepy and very weird. Really, I, I always love these videos though. You guys bring me these and I have literally no explanation, like zero explanation for these. It makes it all the more mysterious and all the more creepy. Yet, as it stands, this video cannot be deciphered at all. There's no other info other than what's in the video, not even captions, the channel's description, nothing. The name's weird as fuck, but I gotta admit, I kinda love it. Now, the channel is only a year old, so maybe it's got something more in the future, but as it stands, it will remain a mini-mystery. Sometime in the summer of 2021, I was given a message by someone who led me to a certain video titled Firma Ludzka. Unfortunately, I can't find the email anymore, but I do know about the video in question. If I recall, the emailer told me how they found this strange and disturbing video online and had no idea where it came from or why exactly YouTube recommended this channel to him. Funnily enough, if you go through the comment section of this video, you'll find some other people talking about how YouTube recommended this to them randomly. Some even found this on Reddit. The video depicts strange visuals and bubbling noises. It would seem it takes place within a barn, and there we see a man, completely naked I assume, laying on the floor with tubes connecting to him, one from his mouth and the other I assume connected to his genitals. Yeah, it's fucking weird. It's also weird that YouTube would recommend this of all things, but it's been under a few people's radars and well, I wanted to talk about it. Now if you're just as corrupted as I am from the horror spooky community, you'd already be guessing by now that this might be some sort of weird elaborate ARG or something like that, exploring this channel called the, well I'm not good with Polish pronunciation so let's just say it belongs to Piotr. Piotr's channel is full of this sort of thing, strange analog horror-esque type videos, all with underwhelming views, much of them having some sort of cryptic meaning. Of course, it doesn't take very long to find out that most, if not all of these videos are performance art videos. Even the one called Firma Lutska has the word performance in the description, so that rules out any form of ARG shenanigans that might have been implied. Though I would like to take a second to appreciate Piotr's work, as his stuff is legitimately from the 90s and not some strange emulation of VHS distortions and whatever else you see in analog horror nowadays. It's got those grimy, washed out colors with a bit of flicker. Ah, it's just, it's just so good. He's also had plenty of his other work on his channel, his involvement in all of them, well, I can't be too sure, but I was curious to know what exactly the purpose of Furman Lutzka was. And wouldn't you know it, I shot him an email through his own personal website. 
peterstyle.eu. And guess what? He responded. And here's his response. Hi. Now I know why I suddenly got so many comments under this video. It's your work, right? Yes, it's my old performance piece video documentation. The idea was quite simple. I want to put myself in the position of the breeding pig or a cow on the farm. Best, Piotr, his last name. Now in case anyone was curious, no, I've never talked about Piotr before. Maybe his name is Peter, maybe I should call him Peter. Oh, whatever. The sudden increase in comments and views is likely caused by the algorithm, as many have mentioned, or someone else's involvement. Well, with that out of our way, I highly encourage you all to view some of Piotr's art pieces. He's got a fascinating eye of the world and might even inspire horror and surrealist lovers all over. There's really nothing more exciting to me than channels that have me genuinely curious. But sometimes I stumble upon videos that may be just a bit more than what they seem on the surface. I was emailed about this channel on YouTube called Sialiu? Sialiu? Yeah. A channel that I'm assuming was started by someone who lives in China, as many of the videos are in Chinese and they're all just videos of Sialiu driving his motorcycle in the city or countryside relatively fast, but in none of these videos is he breaking the law, or if he is, it's not really noteworthy more than just speeding. However, there is one video that he has that is titled in English, Produce. Nothing more, nothing less. No description, no subs, nothing. Yet, what the video does contain is audio of a woman or a child sobbing profusely, the crying getting worse and worse, and the agony and despair in their voice growing more and more. Now I have to warn you that if you're sensitive to audio stuff and or if your stomach never really sat well with videos like the brick lady, ugh, then I'd recommend skipping to this timestamp. Otherwise, well, you've been warned. Take a listen. Three and a half minutes of audio, and it's nothing but the cries from what I assume to be a woman in an empty building next to a street or highway with the windows open. Because you can very clearly hear the wind and the outside. It also sounds like there's a shower running, maybe it's raining, could be either. Now, shockingly enough, you are able to hear her speak but I can't speak Chinese, and I understand Mandarin is a dialect of Chinese, so I can't really determine if that's her dialect. Could be Cantonese for all I know. I'm not really sure. There are also a few times where you can hear her very, very clearly speak, so if anyone out here knows Chinese, please let me know in the comments if you can even understand her. Again, I'll be playing the audio. Skip to this timestamp. I just want to emphasize how clear you can hear her voice and how clearly you can hear her talk. Take another listen. Now with my ratchet detective skills, I tried using Google Translate to capture some of the clearer parts of her speaking, but to no avail. The title at the beginning, however, was translatable by Google, and in English, roughly translates to Howling, you take me to the hospital first. So what could it be? Well, let's dive into the deep end and talk about theories and work ourselves up from more logical theories. First and foremost, the more outlandish theory of most of us would probably assume already. 
automatically thinking that this is some sort of horrible crime happening. The title produce could be interpreted as a sort of sign or code that gives away what's happening here, a woman being carved and harvested of her own organs, begging her captors to let her go or to say that they're hurting her in some way or shape or form. The water droplets could be from the bathtub, the shower overhead, or perhaps a water hose draining away the blood. The building sounds empty with no furniture whatsoever. Likely this is happening in an abandoned building where no one can hear or see what's happening. The title could be in reference of her crying, howling, and begging to be taken to the hospital. Maybe. No, or it could be based entirely, literally, with no evidence. Or... This could just be some crazy lady in the hallway of some guy's apartment, screaming and throwing a tantrum. The guy maybe was recording the audio as some sort of proof that this was happening, maybe to show the police his evidence, or maybe she was begging one of her neighbors, the guy who captured it even, to be taken to the hospital because of some sort of pain. That doesn't really explain the title though, does it? Well, then that takes me to my third theory which is simple and very boring, but it's one that makes the most sense to me at least. And it's just random audio of this guy watching a movie or a porno and learning how to edit. Produce can actually be read as produce. It actually is a very common default type name for projects in a lot of video editing software. I remember when I first started editing, my videos were made using a really weird Chinese made editing software. And by default, each new project was just titled produce or produce one, produce two, etc. It would explain the weird edits halfway through the titles, the stock image of flowers that likely came with the program, but still wondering why exactly this person decided with this audio and whether or not that was a good idea to use some sort of, I don't know, practice for his editing skills I, I, I have no idea this still doesn't really answer why the very beginning of the video is titled howling take me to the hospital so i have no clue ultimately though if it's really just nothing more than what i think it is then it's just some weird funky video from 10 years ago that has no real merit or worth just like billions of other videos on youtube but if by chance this is a recording of something truly despicable something incredibly vile as human trafficking or organ theft, then this video is not only illegal, not only a portrayal of real human suffering, but the people who recorded this 11 years ago might have likely gotten away with it, and they will most likely never be found. And this is the shadow that was last left behind before they disappeared. Okay, this one is really, really weird. It's freaky. I, I tried to put it in Traumathon, but I had no idea if it was like too niche for that. But okay, listen, I just want you to listen to the following song I'm about to give you. Don't worry. There's no jump scare. There's no loud noises. There's not even a creepy face. I promise. What I want you to do for me is to just listen to the song in its entirety. It's only about a minute long, so you don't have to listen that long. And I want you to just leave a comment down below. Tell me what emotions you feel, what sort of vibe you're getting. Just tell me what you think of this song, what it says to you emotionally. All right? Okay, take a listen. So what do you think? Leave a comment down below. I, I just want to try this weird experiment. Because you see, this song is a song from the Disney trivia game, Disney Seen It. Back in the 2000s and 2010s, Seen It was a trivia game on DVD where people would just watch clips from certain movies, then they just answer trivia questions. There was one for pretty much everything, Twilight, 
Seinfeld, Friends, Glee, all that garbage. Yet for some reason, and I swear to you that I am not fibbing, for some reason, Disney Seen It was believed by many kids to be one of the worst ones because of its quote-unquote unnerving music. That song you just heard, and other music from this specific Seen It DVD, is just mind-bogglingly scary for a lot of kids and if you visit the comment section of this video you will get dozens upon dozens of testimonials from grown-ups talking about how they were super scared and terrified by this music some even claiming to cry whenever they heard it and some still getting scared by it as an adult now i personally figured that this was some sort of trend on tiktok because a lot of times these sort of patterns happen it's usually from some horror talk uh, i don't know challenge basically claiming spooky stuff about seemingly innocent junk when there's really nothing but i have looked it up on tiktok and really there's not much on this specific topic there's only one person who actually talks about how the music did creep them out but other than that there's really nothing at all these comments are also three years old, but so is the video itself. There are no other videos that have the scene it music, so I can't tell if this is some sort of prank or some sort of creepy trend from three years ago or something. But honestly, some of these are just from a few weeks ago, so I don't think it's related to any sort of trend whatsoever. When I look up creepy Disney music scene it music shit, I don't get anything either. So let's just assume people really are creeped out by this song. Let's ask ourselves why. I listened to the song myself quite a few times, even asking my girlfriend and our roommate what exactly they thought of the song, and they both described it as jolly, adventurous, curious, but literally nothing remotely close to creepy, unsettling, or scary. Honestly, I'm just about ready to say that y'all got some unresolved trauma you need to take care of, but I'm still incredibly curious as to why so many people are so freaked out by this. Like I said earlier, I really wanted to put it in Traumathon, maybe even for later this year, but it's just so niche that I don't even know if it's worth talking about. I don't even know where to begin. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in the comments and if anyone at all feels the same way or if you felt this way in the past. This next story is one I'm shocked to see very little coverage of, especially when you consider just how massive the fan base is. Since the inception of video games, gamers have been fascinated by the process behind the scenes and what it's like to make video games in general. It's those parts of the industry that we seldom ever see coverage of, unlike movies and TV shows who always seem to have behind the scenes content included somewhere, video games get almost nothing. And while sometimes what we learn isn't always let's say the most flattering things to hear about a game studio or a gaming development company, it's this sort of unknown knowledge that has us curious as to what happens while games are being developed. There are many games that have people curious, but some pique our interest more than others, and one of those games is Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Seriously, this is the game Sonic fans love dissecting more than any other. There are tons of lost levels, assets, concepts that people love digging up, and with more and more prototypes and demos getting its files re-uploaded online, we get to see the glimpse of how this game was made, the thought process, and all the other things in between. But something was found within Sonic 2 that nobody would have guessed to find. This is Bobbin Face, an image or perhaps an animation that could be found within one of Tom Paine's infamous box of discs. To summarize, a former artist for Sega Technical Institute, aka STI, <laughs> was contacted by Sega fans back in 2004 and 2009 about what he did during his time working at Sega, specifically what he had worked on in Sonic 2. Tom claimed he had a box of old Sega assets, including maps for Sonic 2, character designs, enemy designs, backgrounds, assets, animations, and a ton of other things in a small box of discs. At the time, Tom was only about able to share a few of his creations online, most of which was never seen, as most of his creations just remained in the cutting room floor. At the time, this was a big deal for Sonic fans and digital archaeologists who were curious about Sonic 2. Then about 10 years later, Jason Morehouse, owner of Nostalgia Alley, located in San Francisco, had a random encounter with Tom Paine. 
where he had shortly discovered that he was once an employee of Sega. Interested, Jason asked if he still had any of his old stuff, to which Tom Payne soon revealed his little box of old stuff. Jason, being someone who can archive old files, asked Tom if he could take the stuff to re-upload and archive the files online, and so Tom agreed. Jason, along with the help from the Video Game History Foundation, swiftly went to work and dumped all the files online for everyone to see. You can check out all the files that were dumped in the description down below. There will be two different links. One will be leading to the interview with Jason and one will be leading to the cutting room floor where you can see a majority of everything that was found. And so we come back to this. This weird, unnatural, super cursed image. The image itself just has a man with a weird smile giving a peace sign to the audience while the gates of hell are just waiting right behind him. There's also a sprite sheet for his face, which indicates that this can be animated to show him winking, or sad, oh yeah, let's not forget the bullet wound oozing out blue blood. If you think that's freaky, Bob here seems to have his own room, filled with just Bob's face everywhere. Yeah, it's uh, it's not really any better, is it? But as freaky as this is, there's no real telling what this image was supposed to be for, if it was ever meant to be for anything, maybe a background image for an unused level. Perhaps even a cutscene? Nah, I doubt it. But I do want to stress that as creepy as that is, the sort of stuff is usually hidden by developers and artists within the game's files all the time. It's often a way for devs to vent out frustration or to just have fun during their own downtime. Usually they don't expect anyone to find it. Sometimes this sort of stuff is aimed at higher ups, you know, to clown on them, either in good faith or bad. Most of the time though, it's often due to frustration. I also saw someone theorize that this could be lost assets from a cancelled STI <laughs> game called Spinny and Spike vs the Nightmare King. Some of the assets that were found from that game somewhat resemble Bob in some way, which makes sense. Tom didn't just work on Sonic after all, he was hired to do a bunch of art for a ton of Sega related games, most of which were cancelled. Despite this, I still think it's more logical that this is some sort of vent drawing from frustrated artists. That dude got a bullet wound after all, I, I doubt that's something you put in a kids game at the time. I wouldn't be surprised if the dude just got mad of one of his higher ups, especially considering that Tom left STI <laughs> because he believed they were quote unquote getting too persnickety. It could have been Tom. Or or it could have been someone else. Either way, I doubt he'll remember. I mean, this stuff is from 30 years ago. I doubt the dude remembers all the things he drew or did or the times he got mad. Oh well. I guess we'll only have to wait and see. Maybe in 2029, when some random dude finds him walking his dog or drinking at a cafe. I don't know. The world can be small sometimes. I was given this email about two days ago, and ever since then the following topic has been growing. So I'm making this video as fast as I can because I know for a fact that I'll be incredibly uninterested once everyone else gets their hands on it. So the back rooms, that's a thing. Actually, it's one of my favorite concepts to have come out of like pre-pandemic era of horror. It's essentially describing rooms found within a separate space within our reality that sort of acts as test rooms for our world. Sort of like when you're in Gmod, for example, and you turn on no clip, and then all of a sudden you're phasing through the world and finding hidden rooms. These kinds of rooms can be found in pretty much any video game, whether they're 3D or 2D. They're used to test items, test physics, maybe even act as load-in rooms for certain cutscenes, but whatever the case, normally people can't go there unless of course they cheat. Though sometimes you can accidentally get a glimpse of these areas, or maybe even stumble upon them by accident. Well, that's seemingly what happened when one Reddit user by the name of OutExit4 found out when he was just exploring Google Maps one day. Using the following coordinates on screen, the user was able to find a strange area somewhere in Japan that looks similar to a silo or something. Then when using Street View, they found this room, this back room. Also a tiny robot friend. Hello. Unfortunately, if you try to enter the back rooms now, well, you might not be able to, as I've tried for a couple of minutes, even waiting for about two hours, but while the spot might be there, it just won't let me in. Could be that Google learned about this place and decided to take it down. I think it's worth mentioning that anyone can post a photo on Google Maps, by the way, even 360 ones. So if anyone is thinking that this is somehow an ARG made by Google themselves or some sort of conspiracy to remove the real back rooms out of reality, that's just not the case. Of course, this wasn't the first sighting of the back rooms, as shown by another Reddit user just four days ago before this post went up. 
Someone by the name of Glarto345 had found a separate liminal space somewhere in the middle of California in a national park. This particular area looks closer to what people think the classic back rooms looks like, even with ominous writing on the wall instructing everyone not to look up the back rooms or they will fall. That's pretty spook. Oh my god, hi. The third location. I'm not really sure who posted it first or how anyone found it, but it takes us all the way to Florida, specifically found in Cape Romano, where we see the Cape Romano dome houses. Of course, when we go into street view, plot that little motherfucker down, wouldn't you know it? It's spooky. Last one, again, not sure who or when it was found, but taking these coordinates will lead us to Canada. You know the drill, get that yellow bastard, drop his ass, and oh wow. Oh my god. Oh. Uh, oh, it's he. This is actually one of the least known locations. Barely anyone has mentioned this place, and admittedly, it's one of the spookiest. An endless forest with our friend the robot and this spooky ghost man thing. Very scoopy. Actually, I'm not really even sure if this counts as a back room, but maybe it does. I haven't really kept up with the lore. So what does this all mean? Are the back rooms real? No. But if that's the case, then how is it that these places exist? Two of these locations were posted in 2022, this year, yet the rest were posted either in 2011, and allegedly this one place with the infinite hole that I can't enter anymore was supposedly posted in 2013. Mind you, the back rooms wasn't even a concept till around the summer of 2019, where it originated in a 4chan post. At least, this is where it's more commonly known to exist from or originate from. From there, the lore dives deep as more user interest fed into the myth and it became this massive cult following ever since. It's really unknown just how exactly these photos were posted so many years ago when nobody really knew about it back then. And you'd figure, of course, even if these really were posted back in 2011, or even in 2013, someone somewhere must have found out about these images in that time frame. I mean, if we can find these obscure images on Google Maps, then there's no way someone could just miss this, all of this. My guess is that whoever made these images must have edited them in post, as in, this must have been some sort of image beforehand that was just a regular picture that was just replaced with this 360 shot later in the future. But well, that's just a speculation, I'm not even sure if that's possible. Speaking of who made these images, just who is responsible? And certainly not Google. Well, we don't really have to look much further. You see this robot? We've been, we've been pretty much teasing him this whole time. Well, his name is Billy. Billy Le Robot. Billy is a small French YouTube channel that covers a lot of this sort of urban online creepy stuff, like SCPs, creepypastas, and yes, the back rooms. In fact, he was investigating the back rooms not too long ago. There was only one video of him in the back rooms uploaded back four months ago, but I'm assuming that's gonna change soon, and you're probably gonna see a lot more of the back rooms later on in his YouTube career. Going on his Twitter, we'll see that he posted an ominous video titled, It Started, just around the time most people were talking about the back rooms on Google Maps. I'm assuming this is all linked to an in-channel ARG that I'm sure he's working on diligently. Maybe it was a publicity stunt to just promote his channel. I may be interested in covering this as it develops, good art takes time after all, so I can't just take the pieces of the puzzle now as it's most likely just a teaser to what's to come, so if you guys want I'll cover more of Billy Le Robot as he undoubtedly reveals more. Billy has already teased a fifth image and there's possibly a sixth, I don't know. It's most likely somewhere on Google Maps, but Who's to say where exactly? That's for you guys to figure out. If it's possible that there's an ominous fifth or sixth backrooms hiding within Google Maps, please let me know. Unfortunately, as I wrapped up this script, it would seem that Google Maps was on to poor old Billy, as all of these backroom 360 photos no longer exist, except for this one in Canada. And I'm assuming that's because most people don't talk about it or know about it yet. Though, with the upload of this video, that will change by the time it goes up. So. That's that. It's a fun little game made by a funny little robot who has an honestly underrated channel. Seriously, please check out Billy's videos. I, I think he's got some wonderful stuff and I applaud devious shit like this. Oh, great. Oh, great. I got a phone. It always goes. I keep forgetting to turn it off. He's got a lot of cool stuff. Really? I mean, it, it's really bold of him to just upload all of these on Google Maps 
It probably explains why there are several accounts, by the way. One of them called Billy, so that would have tipped it off. He probably knew he was going to get banned for each upload, so yeah, it was smart of him to just upload from different accounts. Either way, that was it. Uh, there's probably more, but like I said, if you're interested in this, let me know in the comments below. If not, then I'm just going to continue on with other stuff. Today's video will be covering probably one of my first paranormal cases ever, and in that regard I hope all of you will remain respectful and open-minded, because we're gonna dive into some real dark magic. No joke. Actually, it's kinda weird to talk about this because it almost feels sacrilegious. While I may not be the most religious person in the world, I still at least want to remain respectful. Therefore, if you're Muslim, I feel it's fair that you know that I will be mentioning many things involving your faith and practices of Islam in general, as today's topic is about the possibility of this one Quran reading video that may or may not be cursed. And by cursed, I mean, like, actually cursed. Not like... Yeah. You know? So today I wanted to talk about this one video recommended by someone on my subreddit. This user cross posted a separate reddit post found in r slash internet mysteries where a separate user talks about two mysterious videos uploaded by a channel named Sarah Ali. These two videos are seemingly innocent Quran reading videos as I hear it's extremely common for people to just pull up these kinds of videos to play as background noise and it's, it's sort of a way to ease them into sleep as well. In many cultures, Quran readings aren't just verbal expressions of language, but many believe it's a way to connect with God and to bring benevolence into one's life. Regardless of the reason, these kinds of videos are very popular, as seen by this screenshot posted by the Reddit user of the two videos uploaded by Sarah Ali, one of them garnering over 3 million views. The video is nothing more than just a screenshot of two prominently well-known Muslims who also happen to be the ones reciting verses from the Quran. Strangely enough, it's not even a complete verse of the Quran, as apparently these are cut off from before they are actually completed, and they're just looped awkwardly for a few hours more. The original post even claims that it's likely that this audio was actually ripped from somewhere else, somewhere else on YouTube, that is. Unfortunately, that has some consequences. At the time of this recording, it would seem that Sarah Ali has been copyright striked, and both of these videos have been pulled down from YouTube. Now, there's a reason for that, and honestly, videos like these are harmless, but in this case, there is much more to these two than one might initially think. While both have since been removed from YouTube for copyright reasons, this Reddit user was smart enough to back up one of the video files before this happened, and so we'll be listening to these four sections of the video titled simply Quran. Take a listen to the first one. I can swallow pills easily. I can swallow pills like anybody. I overcome my fear from swallowing pills. I can swallow pills easily. I can swallow pills like anybody. I overcome my fear from swallowing pills. I can swallow pills easily. This goes on for about a minute or so until eventually going back to the prayer. The term I can swallow pills easily, I overcome my fear of swallowing pills, is likely some sort of subliminal messaging for either the person who uploaded the video or for anyone listening. Perhaps in some naive sense, Sarah Ali hid these messages within the reading to give positive messaging to all who listen. Thing is, doing this is incredibly disrespectful. Stopping a Quran reading just for a motivational message is just pretty rude. In fact, I have a hard time believing that anyone who is actually Muslim would do this on purpose. So while I would brush this off as something incredibly disrespectful yet naive from a well-meaning video, it's the later messages that have me thinking that this might be a bit darker. Take a listen to the next three hidden messages. My mind is blocking any unnecessary fears. My mind is releasing any unnecessary fears. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is talking to. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is dating. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is talking to. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is dating. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is talking to. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is dating. The relationship between Owen Brown and any woman he is talking to get destroyed. The relationship between Owen Brown and any woman he is dating gets destroyed. Brown is spending the rest of his life with me. Owen Brown is spending the rest of his life with me. Owen Brown is coming back to Oric University for me. Owen Brown listen to every word I say to him. Owen Brown listen to every order I give him. Owen Brown listen to every word I say to him. Owen Brown listen to every order I give him. 
Owen Brown listen to every word I say to him. Owen Brown listen to every order I give him. Owen Brown listen to every word I say to him. Owen Brown listen to every order I give him. If you didn't catch that, then I'll be repeating what they said. My mind is blocking any unnecessary fears. My mind is releasing any unnecessary fears. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he is talking to. Owen Brown gets dumped and ghosted by any woman he's dating. The relationship between Owen Brown and any woman he is talking to gets destroyed. The relationship between Owen Brown and any woman he is dating gets destroyed. Owen Brown is spending the rest of his life with me. Owen Brown is coming back to York University for me. Owen Brown listens to every word I say to him. Owen Brown listens to every order I give him. Owen Brown is not enough to every female. So, what could this all mean? Well, it doesn't take long to really connect the dots here. Reading the Quran is much like praying, and for many Muslims, prayer brings good health, and it provides answers to problems they face. Yes, they can ask for things, but true prayer doesn't necessarily ask for the demolishment of one person's life. So knowing this, I came to a conclusion. This video is cursed. Now how did I come to that conclusion? Well, this video reminded me of chants given to higher beings made by cultists and in black magic in general. More often than not, when they try to get something that they normally could not obtain. And in this case, I first thought that whoever this was, was probably using these phrases to hypnotize or indoctrinate Owen Brown, the, I assume, man that she wants to be with while he listens to the video. The OP and the Muslim community also agree, as stated in the post. The thing is, I don't really believe that Sarah Ali really thinks Owen Brown would listen to this. In fact, I don't think she intended to him to listen at all, but to trick others into listening in order to manifest this energy into reality. However, this is not manifestation of goodwill. In fact, this is incredibly manipulative to the point where I thought that maybe, perhaps, it could be some sort of curse, a chant. As mentioned before, you see this in black magic a lot. And while the Quran would normally prevent black magic from manifesting, especially during a recital of a certain verse from the Quran, I believe Sarah Ali is using the energy from everyone who is listening and praying alongside these videos and using that energy into a spell. And the reason I'm coming to this conclusion is because I am currently dating someone who is both Muslim and Southeast Asian. When I brought this up with my partner, and how it could be the work of black magic, she came to the conclusion that it was similar to something called Sun Tao. Sun Tao is a term that describes poisonous black magic that is sent physically or transparently to a victim. In other words, these are curses that some people within Southeast Asia perform, either to gain what they want through force, or to influence others into doing their bidding. I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but in Southeast Asia, this sort of paranormal stuff is a strong belief. So much so that it can be argued as a fact to some. It's so well believed that even politicians have been caught performing black magic against their rivals. The following information I've gathered was from this video. So if you're interested and can understand the language, then I'd say give it a watch. And don't worry, it's Ramadan, so you won't be summoning bad gen by watching it. Anyway, according to this video, Sun Tao comes in three parts. Sun Tao Zahir, Sun Tao Gaib, and a combination of both. Sun Tao Zahir is the physical manifestation of a spell, either to enhance or to perfect something. People who perform this sort of spell often use real-world conduits such as venom or toxic herbs or other things such as the sort. These kinds of spells need to be physically performed or ingested through the victim's body, either by eating the spell, applying the spell to the skin, injecting the spell into the victim's blood, smelling it, or any combination of these four. Meanwhile, Santao Gaib is the opposite. As opposed to being physical, this is completely intangible. 
This is more akin of what most people think a spell is. It is more aligned with the practice of demonology, coercing demons and spirits to do your bidding, etc. However, it's much more strict and more complicated than being buddies with a demon like in Shin Megami Tensei. In fact, the rules are incredibly strict, so much so that it can often lead to the downfall of the caster as opposed to the victim. Notably, there's one form of Santo Gaid that matches what we're talking about, and that being Seru. Seru means to call or to invite, and it's a form of Santo Gaid that utilizes speech, text, symbols, and drawings. With this curse, you can make your wishes come true, but again, it's incredibly strict, and, uh, well, not so fun fact, it requires an animal sacrifice. Now, notice I said text and speech. If we were to believe that this is in fact a curse, then the bigger picture begins to get much clearer. Sarah Ali is likely a former student of York University. In fact, we know there is 100% a student who used to be in York University because there exists a LinkedIn profile of a Sarah Ali that went to said university. Moreover, she is stated to live in Toronto where York University is located. There also exists another Sarah Ali who attended York College in the UK, and wouldn't you know it, she attended around the same time these videos were uploaded. Is it a coincidence? Maybe. Regardless, it's likely here, when she used to attend, that our Sarah met a man by the name of Owen Brown. Owen must have been someone she really liked, perhaps even obsessed over. It's very clear that she was jealous of him, perhaps even stalking him, as we hear in this video that she wanted Owen Brown to fail in every relationship he had with every woman he ever met. Except, of course, her. She even mentions him coming back to York University, implying that Owen Brown left. What's more, this is very much malefic in nature. It's not some sweet love potion or some love hypnosis or whatever. It's very clear that Sarah Ali wants to control Owen, all of his life aspects and his romantic life in general. She repeats in the video that Owen Brown will obey everything she says. Owen Brown will listen to every word she tells him. This is not a sweet romantic thing, this is a manipulative relationship, and it could be much more harmful than we think. Look, getting past the whole paranormal aspect of all of this, Sarah Ali could in fact be a real human being who really believes in this. Whether or not you do is irrelevant. The point is this woman could be feverishly obsessed with Owen Brown to the point where she could be considered a stalker. Nobody in their right mind would post a video of a Quran reading and hide subliminal messages of manipulation to one specific person unless they were sick enough to cause them harm or believe that they could control them by any means necessary. Now, this is but just a slice of what could be going on. I'm not familiar with other cultures out there that also practice black magic, but I'm assuming that in many cases it'll be similar to what I have explained. It could be that this isn't really black magic and that it could be just some way of manifesting something in Sarah's life, but regardless, it is still done with ill intent. There's also the matter of the first video, which is 10 hours long yet no longer exists. Did this too have subliminal messages? Well, I was able to actually find the video, as it was re-uploaded by someone that I'm assuming didn't know any better. Yes, this is the Sarah Ali edit, and yes, there are voices in this one too. However, this one is far more subtle, and it's hidden underneath the prayer. Unfortunately, I can't show you that one part of the video due to copyright infringement, but I can show you at least a second of the video to show you that there is still mumbling within it. Take a listen. To any female except me. Owen Brown is nobody to any female except me. What's interesting to me is that many people in the comments section actually acknowledge the muttering and some even go as far as to call this a spell. Just as I explained earlier, though some have claimed that this is somehow a spell or a curse meant to control someone, many others believe that Owen Brown is actually not a real person at all, but in fact the name of a djinn. But like I said earlier, whether or not you believe in the paranormal is irrelevant because the fact is this person, Sarah Ali, probably does. And she is resorting to doing some crazy shit just to get the attention of a man she probably liked. As for whether or not she stalks the man in real life is a mystery, but hopefully this is the last we'll hear of Sarah Ali. Because if her obsession has anything to say about her real life tendencies, then it could be possible that something worse could happen in reality. 
So starting off with a very quick update, the previous mini mysteries episode we did was about a strange channel called Punish Babies. It had just one video with a strange title, and after I made that video, well, that video vanished. Curiously enough, the channel does exist, so I'm guessing one of two things happen. Either YouTube took the video down because it broke some sort of guidelines, I don't know, YouTube can be weird like that, or the creator of this channel decided to take down the video themselves, for whatever reason, I'm not sure. But checking back on my computer's hard drive, I actually still have the video right here. So in some way, I'm kind of the current owner of lost media. Kinda. I mean, I'd, I'd figure lost media is just lost TV shows or movies, not really this. A anyways, now obviously I'm not going to re-upload the video because, well, I don't want to strike on my channel if this video is somehow not YouTube friendly, but also, well, it's not my video. It's really not my content to share. If the uploader wants to upload it again, then that's on them, not on me. But yeah, thought that'd be interesting to share. Remember the time when days felt shorter? When you guys begged to stay another day at the camping park? The view of the Grand Canyon? The road that took us there? My happiest days. This is My Happiest Days, an ARG or unfiction channel. I don't know what to call these anymore. Either way, I'm probably wrong about someone archiving VHS tapes from the 70s and 80s. The contents within these tapes contain information from when the creator's father, Morgan Turner, used to work for Canyon Computers, where he designed the Field Computer Mega Farm and the Turner Assembly, a machine that could potentially make humans immortal. Now, oddly enough, despite this being the channel trailer and the overall narrative this channel wants to push, this introduction is actually three months apart from when the first video actually was uploaded, yet most of these videos are about the Turner Assembly. Even more curious is the video titled Different, which is, well, different from the rest, as we can actually see the narrator comment on the strangeness of this one particular tape, despite them all honestly being very strange. This led me to believe that this entire channel is out of order. Order. The upload order does not correlate with the story's order, but which ones come first is easier to answer than which ones come after, as each clip is esoteric in nature and, well, kinda unsettling. Hidden within all of the noise, we can see various hidden texts that can barely be seen, even when the image is brightened up and the contrast is all the way up. Many of these videos are incredibly short, and some are more disturbing than others. Such as this one video called We Laugh Together, which features what looks like the front of a house at night, followed by the sounds of someone knocking on the door, and then this. Damn it, damn it, damn it. agonizing screams. All the while this image lingers right in front of you. The image itself is hard to see really, it's as if the video was compressed a thousand times. Looking through some of the other videos though, like Despair and the channel's trailer itself, we'll see this image at varying levels of clearness, though it's never really 100% clear to us, it's always a little blurry or maybe a little too dark. It would seem that this is in fact Morgan Turner the father of the channel's creator, and the man who took all these videos. 
possibly even the one trying to get out this message, despite how strange they are. Messages like, I'm becoming human again, I can't stand being like this, or I feel like crying, but I can't. Interestingly, in that same video, Despair, you can hear moaning and groaning in the background. Something's happened to Morgan Turner, and these videos are meant to show his despair and anguish. His only available actions is to remember the good old days. His memory of his family is the only thing keeping him going, and constantly he apologizes to them. Keep in mind that all of these videos were uploaded in the wrong order. It would also mean that these tapes are in the wrong order as well. So there was a point where Mr. Turner was sane, at least as sane as he could be, but then slowly began to lose his mind and possibly even his human form. It would also seem that whatever happened to Morgan Turner is happening to his son, as we can see that with not only the upload dates being out of order, but in the community tab itself, as the uploader constantly posts almost nonsense posts sprinkled with some paranoia. It's here, however, that we eventually learn the uploader's name, Jonas. Now this is undoubtedly an incredible well done unfiction and it seems to keep going even as recently as last month. The last two videos uploaded by the creator were incredibly well done and dive a lot deeper into the lore of this channel. The production itself seems to have gotten better, the effects are superbly done and I'll be honest it is a hauntingly scary channel that I am really eager to revisit someday. I mean, I'm a stickler when it comes to formatting, but forgiving the format for a second, I mean, seriously, this resembles more film reels than VHS tapes. The sound design on each of these videos are hauntingly well done. Like, really, the only thing I wish this channel did differently is the narration. I am not a fan of the obviously spooky voices trying to be spooky. I'd actually think it'd be more effective if the ominous text just did all the work. Thankfully, it would seem the person behind the channel dropped that immediately. I also think it would benefit from not retreading old ground and while well, borrowing a lot of cliches from other analog horrors. It should really be comfortable with doing its own thing. I, I, I don't really like seeing the same kind of analog horror over and over again. Now, I want to focus on this channel a lot more. Really, I do. But I am currently backlogged with a ton of mysteries and one specific ARG that, well, if you've been in my streams recently, is my current main focus. Someday I will hopefully revisit this channel, as there's a lot that I actually purposely omitted, details that I feel would be way more fun to discover yourself. Seriously, I don't want to ruin the surprise that this channel holds, I, I think all of you should experience it yourselves and tell me what you think. User 9472 is by far one of the most unsettling channels I'd ever come across. It's a channel that features an array of bizarre videos, some of which, more or less, just slideshows with creepy music. And though they often aren't anything more than that, I'm honestly just so fascinated by the amount of nothing this channel has to offer, even down to the titles. The sounds featured in every video are just so unsettling, and the images, even more so.
finding any of these images via Google Lens yield no results, almost suggesting that these are all genuine photos and videos captured by user 9472. At first, I figured that this is some sort of ARG. And yes, I know it gets real tiresome to talk about that sort of thing, but hey, the popularity of ARGs never seem to diminish. However, there is no information whatsoever given to the audience about anything, including whether or not the footage belongs to 9472. At first, I assumed that these videos and photos didn't belong to them, and it was instead copied somewhere else. But then that leads to the question of where did these videos come from? Especially when the videos in question are as weird as this. Actually, what's messed up about this video is that it's apparently categorized as kid friendly, seeing as how the YouTube Kids logo is right there, so you know, that's kind of shitty. The fact that none of these videos have titles or even any info is really concerning when you consider that this channel has a few videos that seem, well, more than off putting. The ones that I'm referring to are these three videos. One video features a naked woman biting onto a raw fish in the middle of a lake who seems to be on the verge of crying. Her back is sweltered with what seems to be bruises and cuts. I honestly thought I saw this image somewhere before, and the pixelation almost makes me believe that this is from some movie or show, but I just couldn't get anything. It'd be very concerning if these two videos, or should I say photos, actually belong to a real missing person, or worse. Then there's this video, which again features two very strange photos, one featuring a person whose face is blurred out, while another shows the top of someone's head. This might come out of the blue, but as someone who's seen a bunch of gore videos and photos when I was younger, I can't help but be reminded of that. It's probably nothing more than just someone's head photographed from the top, but I get this real uneasy feeling that it could be something bad. I won't jump to conclusions though. There's really nothing indicating that this channel is anything more than just some creepy art project, but then we get this other video which isn't even available on YouTube anymore. This one, however, gives us more questions and answers as it features a group of masked people and, as the sun alleges, a dead body. They're totally breathing, by the way. That's not a dead body. To me, this sort of confirms that this is nothing more than just a spooky art project. But some of the creepy stuff featured can be concerning if it didn't have any context. And I mean, none of this has any context, but I feel this sort of is too spooky to honestly be taken seriously. You know what I mean? Now, I am aware that some of these videos have descriptions, but they're very nonsensical and really hold no true value into identifying the purpose of this channel or the people behind it. There's only one video that has Morse code for a description, which translates to... Fucking nothing. Yeah, I think it's safe to say there's really not much going on here. Or, who knows, it could be some serial killers taunting and flaunting their kills and elaborate traps. If we're allowed to think fantastically, at least. This one video here portrays a small room with a door that's locked, which could indicate where this person holds their victims hostage. Apparently, these videos all usually get deleted and then re-uploaded, so there's actually quite a few videos that just don't exist anymore or are currently unlisted. This channel has been around for four years now, so I think there's actually quite a considerable amount of content we're just not seeing. In fact, just as I was writing this script, a video featuring a hand rubbing what seems to be blood on their stomach is actually gone. And it was only through Pixels After Dark's video that I was able to find it again. Actually, he has a few more videos that user 9472 used to have on their channel, but no longer has them. So I'd recommend watching Pixel After Dark's video for more information. Though what I will say is fascinating is the fact that at some point, these videos did have titles in Italian. Yet for some reason, many of them are gone and every title is completely blank. Whatever. Maybe someday we'll get answers that we're looking for, though I highly doubt it.
Haruto Ito is a bittersweet horror channel to talk about. Actually saying it's purely horror is kind of misleading. It's more like some sort of absurdist experimental project made by someone who wanted to convey the feeling of anxiety, dread, confusion, and can be in some cases comedic in a weird esoteric way. I call it lo-fi horror to eek and shriek to. It sort of had some kind of weird Japanese story at the start of this channel's inception, but as time went on the Japanese aesthetic sort of got dropped. And the creator was more experimental with like Spanish, Russian, Dutch. Love this video by the way, I, I can't explain it, I just love it. Yeah, it's hard to really say what I feel about this channel. I remember stumbling upon this channel about a year or two ago and thinking it looked kind of cool, maybe even cool enough to talk about, but as time went on the channel became more and more confusing, not really having any sort of end goal or meaning whatsoever. But then why should it? That's sort of the problem with covering horror on the internet. We sort of ask ourselves, why does it exist, rather than to enjoy the fact that it does exist. And frankly, I really do love coming back to these videos just to feel some sort of inspiration. It's like visual candy to me. The person behind this channel also got better at his visuals as time went on. Even if not everything was visually appealing at the time, they clearly experimented and did a bunch of weird shit, like even animation. Some of these are honestly reminiscent of Adult Swim bumpers being very chill and relaxing, with songs overlaid with strange visuals underneath. There's something homey about them. But of course, then we have these kinds of videos, which completely contrast either the video before or after it, but I don't mind too much. I think the person behind this channel just wanted to goof off and do weird shit, maybe even slightly horrific shit. I don't know why I said it like that. I can also definitely tell that there was an overarching story written here and there with this one face being constant early on in the channel's existence, but that too was soon dropped. That's why it's a bit bittersweet to talk about this channel. Because earlier this month, the creator of the channel uploaded a video which was titled End. In the description, the creator, Haruto, decided that they were done with this channel and wants to just focus on their real life. Maybe they'll come back, but maybe they won't. Who's to say? I'm just happy it existed because frankly, I kind of just like what he did. The visuals mixed with the music. And I, I just, I don't know, I like watching weird stuff without really thinking too deep on them. I hope you feel the same way. I mean, I figured some of you might like what I just showed you here because we often share the same taste in weird shit. So if you're interested in just being weirded out for the sake of it, check out Haruto Ito. Okay, seriously, hear me out though. There's this channel that some of you might have seen called Family Guy Compilations that literally all they do is just upload Family Guy Compilations. It's not an officially endorsed channel by any means, but it's very clear that someone out there likes Family Guy enough that they decided to just upload random clips from their favorite episodes. That's all well and good, and it's certainly not the only channel that does this on YouTube, but what is weird, and honestly kinda icky, is what he shows at the end of his videos. Take a look. So yeah, kinda weird, but certainly nothing nefarious, right? It's not even like you can find this on all of his videos, it's just in a select few. However, things get weirder and weirder when you begin to realize this guy, whoever owns this channel anyways, has a lot of videos of little girls, all of them different, on his videos. Why such a big variety of them? That's the part that weirds me out. Oh yeah, and on Family Guy compilations? What exactly does that add? Well, according to the channel owner, it allegedly helps to tear away Fox from his videos and prevents them from copyright claiming the video outright, which is bullshit. Sure, that kind of sounds like a logical explanation, but why only on a few of his compilations and not all of them? And if he really did this innocently, why cover the girl's face later on? Well. There is a new rule now, I believe, on YouTube guidelines that you're not really allowed to show the faces of little kids unless you have the parents' consent. So maybe that's why, but if that's the case, why not just use, I don't know, stock footage of a raccoon? Why put the extra effort in featuring kids at the end of your compilation? There's also this guy at the bottom right corner of some of his compilations, again added there as to deter away copyright bots, and it's like, okay, if that's the case, why not just use this guy? 
I, I mean, sure, it's weird having him there too, but not as freaky as just having a bunch of little girls be your protection against copyright. Some of these videos featuring other girls have since been taken down, and what you're seeing is my downloaded versions of these videos before being taken down. Some of you might be saying that they were taken down due to copyright issues, but I'm actually here to tell you that it wasn't. Actually, I have a feeling it has something to do with the kids featured here, because if this were a copyright issue, then YouTube would say video taken down due to copyright issues, as opposed to video deleted. This makes things a bit more questionable. And honestly, the reasoning is weak at best. Now, at the time of me writing this script, I noticed that a few details have been missing since I first found out about this channel through my subreddit r slash gooseboos. Many times I get suggestions, I give them a quick glance, and if they seem interesting, I write them down, which leads me to a few topics being covered a few months later. And unfortunately, this has the same consequences of missing missing details being lost forever. I did have the foresight to download some of the videos as evidence in case this person ever decided to take them down, which they did, but didn't get the description, which used to have a link to his business on Telegram. Now all of these videos have the generic thanks for watching description. The only remaining proof of this link ever existing is through Pixel After Dark's video on the same topic, which I highly recommend watching as it covers many details I cannot currently access due to what seems to be a cover up of everything Pixel's mentioned. Seriously, he's got a great channel, so click on the link below to give him some love. I mean, I already mentioned him twice in one video, so might as well. At any rate, going back to the cover up, I also want to acknowledge that the girls featured in these videos are apparently all from the same channel, The Arrow Faction, which has since stopped making videos about a few years ago. I don't know why exactly this guy is using this footage from a seemingly unknown channel, but what's more confusing is that he stopped using the other girls in his channel and is now just using one specific girl, just with, you know, an an emoji over her face. Though he still uses her videos, she is now censored out with an emoji and all of the audio is gone. For the most part, people are just ignoring the girls at the end of the videos, probably because they only watch part of the video before leaving. It is a compilation after all, so they most likely just watch part of the video that they wanted to see and then leave. But some do mention the girls and are totally weirded out, or are weirdos themselves and leave incredibly inappropriate comments. There are other channels that also feature adult animation videos that these little girls are in, but they've either completely disappeared or they just don't exist. It's disturbing to think why exactly these girls exist at the end of these videos. Perhaps the business that this channel has had was incredibly nefarious, or perhaps it had nothing to do with the girls at all. There's also the assumption that the person running this channel is even an adult. We could assume that the person running this channel is maybe 12 or 14 years old and they just like making compilation of their favorite TV show and just doesn't understand YouTube rules or why this is creepy, though I sort of doubt this. I'm assuming that this channel is nothing more than a content farming channel as can be seen at the end of some of his videos. As we can see, these annotations lead us back to another channel called Lego Nation, which is absolutely a content farm channel due to the incredibly random Lego videos uploaded. Many, I'm assuming, weren't even made by them, if not all of them were not made by them, as none of the titles even remotely match what is being presented. Okay, so quick update. This is very interesting. Uh, while I was making this video and editing it, they changed one part of the video that I was actually going to talk about, but I can no longer do that because the playlist that I was going to mention no longer exists. Essentially what I was going to say is that there were four playlists that lead to a few videos that were unlisted and you can't watch unlisted videos unless someone gives you the link itself. Now the playlists were called ways to donate number one and ways to donate number two. I have no idea what the unlisted videos were in that playlist, but it was kind of creepy because they had four each in the playlist that couldn't be seen and now they're just gone. I have no idea how or why they would take it away all of a sudden, but I, now I can't talk about that one part anymore. Though in some ways I'm kind of glad that they did that because now it makes them seem way more suspicious than what I was initially going to say. Now I can go on and on about the channel, but without any substantial evidence aside from it being creepy and a few users being creepy towards what is being shown, 
I cannot go about making assumptions about these things because that could ultimately end up being more dangerous than what could really be happening. Ultimately, I highly recommend watching Pixels After Dark's video again. He was able to extract more info from what is already missing and he goes a bit more in depth on clues that no longer exist. Check him out and be kind. When it comes to the seemingly infinite amount of content churned by YouTube users, there's always mysteries going on underneath the seedy underbelly of the site. Trenches that are seldom ever explored and places that are sometimes abandoned. Unknown Sunrise is one of those trenches. Now, I'll be straightforward with you, this entire channel is an enigma, and the amount of research I've done is so very minimal in comparison to the scope of this channel's history, as well as the amount of videos it's released. Be that as it may, I'll try to describe this channel as best as I can and interpret what I have found into possible evidence. Firstly, it is a channel that has existed for over six years, it's going to be seven actually in this June. Every video on this channel seems to be in the reference to a book, at least from the title anyways. We'll get to that in a bit. For now, let's focus on the content of each video. You ready? Well, have a look. And that's it. <laughs> that's all these are. Every single video lasts for about five seconds and gives us an image of an unknown cipher and for the past six years these videos have been uploaded at random. Five to six second videos all spread out at random intervals, some uploaded days between each other while others are spread out by a month or three months. Even the amount of videos uploaded in a year is different. For example, six years ago, Unknown Sunrise at its very genesis of its creation made over 150 videos in a year, while the next year it was just filled with about 80 videos, and the number decreases seemingly every year. The complexity of each cipher varies per video also, ranging from a few symbols to several. It's also important to note that the title names are religious in topic, as most of these titles are from books about spirituality mostly Christian spirituality actually, though this is not always the case. In fact, some of these books are just regular fiction books, they have no real historical or religious context at all, they're just made for entertainment, unless there's a different book with the same title, I'm not sure why these are there too. Still, many of them have some sort of cultural importance and imply a deeper spiritual meaning such as Songs of the Mexican Seas, a book published in the late 1800s that, while not religious in itself, is considered a book of cultural importance. Because each title is different and because each cipher is also different I assume, it leads me to believe that these books might be the literal key to solving these cryptic symbols. Though while the cipher itself is different per video, and while each video uploaded was uploaded on a random date, this channel predictably uploaded these kinds of videos every so often at increasingly infrequent rates. That is until just recently on the 13th of May 2021 where Unknown Sunrise made a shocking video that deviated away from their normal content. And that video is this one. And that's about it. The video continues to show the original phrase shown at the beginning, submissions have closed, communications through this channel will cease for now, thank you for your participation, just in several different languages. The Morse code you hear throughout the video is spelling out the channel's name, Unknown Sunrise, and the Morse code itself is on a loop throughout the whole video. Though interpreting this video, we might see that the entire channel was a test of some kind, a test that required submissions from those interested in continuing further on whatever this may be. Although it is interesting to note this one phrase, submissions have closed. This would imply that nobody has been chosen, but there are people who have participated, meaning whatever the next phase of this project is, will most likely first go through an evaluation process to choose those worthy of advancing to the next step. But it's been nearly two years, and so far there have been no updates. But what in the hell is this channel? I mean, seriously, what exactly is it? Well, let's try our best to figure it out. Keyword, try. First, let's go through the obvious, most logical explanation behind this channel, and it's mystical bullshittery. 
It is a failed ARG. It always runs back to that, doesn't it? Well, as boring as it may sound, it is the most logical explanation. Now, to remember that this channel enthusiastically started around six years ago with about 150 videos being uploaded within the first year of its existence. Then that number died down during the following years, possibly because the creator of this channel had a lack of interest. And if you've ever been in a position where you had to entertain people, but they never really deflected that sort of energy back at you, then you know how it would feel to show your interest to people who don't really care or to nobody at all. It's just the law of diminishing returns, really. Well, that's a very easy out. We can just clearly say that about any channel we've ever looked at, honestly, and really have no clues or evidence that says otherwise. But even if it were a failed ARG, it's quite an interesting one. I mean, I've never really figured out what any of these said, and it's kind of hard to find the answers to any of these videos at all, but it is pretty important to know that there are a lot of titles. Most of them are unique. In fact, I don't think any of them repeat at all. And it is worth noting that the ciphers themselves have never been figured out. Is it because they're bad puzzles or is it because they really are cleverly disguised? We'll learn later on exactly what these symbols are, but for now, just know that this was not some simple ARG that was made by someone who really gave it no thought. Someone did give this a lot of thought. It's not just Morse codes and really simple ciphers that you'd see like binary or something like that. It's something actually pretty complicated. So somebody would have to have a sort of knowledge or a passion for these sorts of puzzles to actually create something pretty in depth. And well, it is really in depth. So if this channel isn't some sort of failed ARG made by some random kid on the internet, then what could it be? Looking for the more fantastical ideas, we can speculate that it might be some sort of initiative close to Cicada 3301, which if you don't recall, was a series of puzzles given to the public with the intent of finding, quote, highly intelligent people, unquote. Nobody has really ever solved exactly who Cicada 3301 is or who they are, if there's multiple people involved, or if it's some sort of organization, or really what their entire objective was. Despite the fact that many, if not all, of the puzzles have already been solved, though I doubt it's as in-depth as that. Cicada 3301 had several outside components, whereas this one puzzle seems to be just entirely based on this channel. What even is the puzzle, actually? As I speculated before, the titles might be a cipher to decrypt these symbols, but what exactly are these symbols anyways? Well, it seems like these symbols are closely related to, if not straight up copies, of the Vinca symbols. These are untranslated symbols made by Neolithic Vinca culture, made several thousands of years ago and considered by many anthropologists as one of the first examples of human writing, sometimes described as pre-writing. Since they came from such a far off culture from a time where man had only just begun to understand the semblance of writing and language itself, many of these symbols have remained a mystery amongst all those who study them, and as it stands now in this particular puzzle or ARG or whatever they want to call it, there are instances of 171 different symbols being used throughout this entire channel, meaning there's well beyond more symbols than there are letters in the English alphabet. That is, of course, assuming that all 171 symbols are from the Vinca, as some people have noted that some of these symbols are completely original and aren't from anything known. It is possible that these symbols are from a form of lexigraphy, where each symbol represents a word, a phrase, an idea, or something of the like. To discern what each symbol represents, you'd have to have read the book, which, looking at the sheer amount of videos uploaded alone, would imply that the person who can solve these would be someone who's well-read in worldly cultures and religion, which probably isn't as impossible to ask, especially if we caught this channel as it was uploading new videos every two weeks or so, which is an ample amount of time for someone to read a book and decipher the video. That's still asking a lot out of someone, and it could ultimately not be true. Some of these symbols might even be red herrings and not mean anything at all. As speculated before, we assume they were all Vinca symbols, but many of them just aren't. Adding further to the confusion of where these symbols are coming from, some people have said that they might be from the Tartarian tablets, which are related to the Vinca symbols but are a different sort of subset of the symbols, and some people have argued that they're the actual early alphabet, and it's like, fucking holy shit! Even the profile picture of Unknown Sunrise is in Vinca. 
It's actually a symbol called Gunfoxy, which is an Icelandic sigil meant to be put on the soles of your shoes to bring about luck and victory during Icelandic wrestling or combat in general, I guess. I have no fucking clue how any of this has to do with whatever we're talking about right now, like at all. So here's Biru. Maybe I'm just looking too deep into this, honestly. I mean, really, expecting a bunch of randos online to solve an unsolvable language is asking for a bit much, don't you think? Actually, it's almost like the creator of this channel is asking for something impossible. I mean, really, why something as random as the Vinca symbols? Why correlate them to these books or whatever about religion or culture? I mean, no doubt there's some sort of theming of religion and culture there in the channel somewhere. It's very obvious that there's something relating to that, mainly Christianity, actually, with the main objective of this entire puzzle, whatever that objective may be, connecting to that theming. Honestly, though, it doesn't really add up to why or how, because none of these puzzles have been solved. Honestly, guys, if I can be real with you for a second, I've only just barely scrape the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this Vinca culture stuff. There's an enormous amount of information that I've just left out or haven't researched that deeply into because, well, I don't think it's really that important to this channel. Seriously, if the channel expected people to solve an unsolvable language, then either the people behind the channel are either super naive to the point of ignorance or we're looking in the wrong direction. I believe the latter, actually. It's likely these symbols are nothing more than a cipher, not really something to be solved, but something that can be interpreted, and whatever hints we were given with each title might somehow be the key. I can definitely say with some confidence that in some way these puzzles can be solved. After all, there are some abnormalities to keep note of, such as this one video called Virgin of the Sun having a red border, which could indicate that this particular cipher is different than the rest. Yet honestly, the answers might be so esoteric and so obscure that many could only ever dream of answering any of these puzzles. Like seriously, just take a glance at the Solving Unknown Sunrise subreddit to see just how deep it goes. It's a dead subreddit that hasn't been active in years, but the people who were active were very passionate about this, and I think if they just worked on it a bit more, they could have solved something, possibly even the ciphers, and helped lead the rest of the way for this channel to being uncovered. Then I could have stolen that research and used it for my own videos and never credit any of them and made a bunch of ad revenue on it based on their research that they worked on and I contributed zero into and then I could have been fucking rich and famous. I mean, erm, um, um, is the mic on? Erm, um, uh, erm, um, I didn't say that. Unfortunately, nobody's ever really talked about it and in these past few years I think I'm the only person who's actually acknowledged this channel existing so if anybody's interested, join that subreddit, or check out the videos yourself. Yet as much as I'd like to dive deeper into these puzzles or ARG or whatever it is, the truth is there's not much to scrape here. Nothing has been solved. Nothing of value has been uncovered. Aside from many of the symbols being found, there's no correlation as to how they're meant to be translated, what the books mean, what the cipher is, if there's even a cipher, I'm just assuming there is, how any of these videos are related, why this channel ended, and why it stopped uploading, if anyone ever actually solved the channel, and how many other questions are still left unsolved, really? Is it one of YouTube's biggest mysteries? Or is it just some failed game made by someone who was bored? I don't know. Truthfully, I just don't. Maybe exposing this out there will help ignite the search once again. But for now, this will remain unsolved. I stole that. Proudly, too. Fuck all y'all. Sometimes the channels I find border on being disturbing by simply being artistic. Art projects often go under my radar just because, well, they're made for art purposes. Nothing really to dissect there, despite how extremely strange they are. Yet this one channel called I Can't Sleep has piqued my interest for several reasons. For starters, the art. It's emblematic of old school emo art you'd see in the late 2000s and early 2010s, back when MySpace was still a thing and the emo trend was much more prevalent. Also seen, but I don't... Listen, I'm not going to mix the two. They're, they're both pretty much the same, except when it's more colorful, okay? Just leave me alone. It's also pretty close to the art style of Jonan Vasquez, creator of the Invader Zim, and Johnny the Homicidal Maniac, which, if you read the comics, resembled the video's art style very, very closely. Also, just speaking out of experience, every emo person I've known 
has loved Invader Zim, so there's also that. Nowadays, it's pretty obscure, the art style anyways. At any rate, as interesting as the art style itself is, it should also be noted the quality of each video. Every single one of these videos are uploaded either in 480p or 360p, which is done on purpose to further the illusion that these videos were made back in the late 2000s when YouTube didn't have an HD option. Yeah, I bet most of you don't even remember that, huh? Living with your fucking plasma screen TVs and sh- The third thing that makes this interesting, however, and worth checking out on your own if you ever want to, is the overlaying story that this channel tells. Here's just a few of their videos. With these animations, we can see that it revolves around one person, a woman it seems, possibly in her 20s or perhaps still a teenager, and at times, a child. The subject matter ranges from subtly creepy to traumatizing horror. The main character is never given a name, but the themes often coincide with one another. Usually it has to do with the pain that the MC goes through, whether that be psychological pain, physical pain, trauma, memories, anxiety, depression or a range of many other things. The severity of this pain is often extreme, portrayed by the MC getting impaled, often being tortured, either by no one or something. This something is portrayed as a hooded figure or perhaps an abstract shape symbolizing either a real person the MC once knew, maybe even trusted, but now they see them as an entity that now haunts them. Meanwhile, the paranormal entities they face could be nothing more than just a flavor of the creator's imagination, such as just creepy stuff for the sake of being creepy, but most likely it represents the MC's mentality, their very own past, their own present, the demons that haunt them, the things that still torture them. Some of these videos have very heavy implication that something horrible had happened to the MC, something traumatic, something that I can't really get into because, well, YouTube won't allow me to talk about it without suppressing the video. But it doesn't really take much careful examination to determine exactly what had happened. Look, the truth is, most of these are very mature in theming and are very uncomfortable to watch to a point where it could even be traumatic for some and unbearable for others. It's meant to make you uncomfortable. It's meant to be an outlet for the artist's pain. It's very clear that a lot of the trauma that they faced was in nature or has something to do with their past. And I don't think it's fair to chastise the artist for making uncomfortable videos or making quote unquote edgy videos to show how they can cope with this sort of pain that they went through. It's their art and I feel like they should express it however way they want it. And I don't think it ever really gets distasteful. It gets incredibly uncomfortable, like I said, but it never really crosses that threshold of being so terrible that it's disrespectful of people who've gone through something similar. Many of these videos don't actually have any sort of chronology to them, and the ones that do are just as abstract as the ones that don't. There are, of course, the other videos that have no story to them at all, and have their own just separate short stories attached, perhaps inspired by a creepypasta or old memes such as Get Down. Remember that? Probably don't. You guys are fucking babies. Either way, each video has an incredibly creepy vibe to them, despite the art style being kind of cute. The animation is usually just black and white with a few colors here and there, but the colors used most often is red, which is used for a multitude of things, but is mainly used for blood or something that represents pain. Each video is also accompanied by silence, and more often than not, the video has no audio at all. The times that it does have audio is used in creepy effect, not always to jump scare the audience, but rather to emphasize the horror or eeriness of the situation, though sometimes it can catch you off guard. Yet despite how much the creator of this channel has given us, 
one thing they've never actually done is given us answers. And I think that's for the best. It's clear this person is reliving a part of their life that was especially dark, possibly sometime late in the 2000s, in which the style itself is reflective of that old 2000s kind of vibe, and why the quality is always at 360p, despite the thumbnails being at a much higher quality. Much of the mysteries behind this channel is mainly about who the creator is and what the overarching story means. They do currently have a Patreon, and while I am a patron myself, I don't dare to reveal the contents of the Patreon page itself. Sorry, you gotta respect the artist after all. All I suggest is, if you like their stuff, go and support them yourself. It's possible we may never know who the creator is, and that's probably for the best. If it's true that many of these animations are based on the creator's own trauma, then they're leaving themselves vulnerable for the sake of their own art. And maybe they'd rather not be known for just that reason. As for what the trauma is specifically, well, I think that's a unique question to ask with a unique answer. It's both very clear what it is these shorts videos are mainly about, but also very vague. It's mostly up to your interpretation. For some people, it hits them pretty hard. Lots of people in the comments have said how they relate to these videos, some even wishing the artists well, hoping that they're okay. It's clear that it resonates with its audience, even if you can't understand the abstract ideas or think that it can be a bit overt with what it's trying to say. I'd reckon most of you will still feel a sense of nostalgia watching these videos, and in the end, that's kind of the point. It's revisiting that dark part of you that you thought you could leave behind, that horrid memory of your past, that part of you that you'd rather forget and maybe have only for it to resurface at the worst times. Maybe you see this and get reminded of your own childhood, or maybe you're reminded of that one thing you're keeping at the darker corners of your mind. Maybe it's a cathartic feeling seeing someone go through what you went through, or maybe it's opening something you wish would remain locked. The truth is, it's a channel meant to make you both nostalgic and uncomfortable. It's horrific in the way it plays with your memories, while also possibly healing for the person behind this channel. Perhaps this is a way they channeled their trauma, or perhaps they just really wanted to make something spooky for spookiness sake. All you can really do is just watch and try to enjoy. And maybe someday I'll cover this more in depth, try to interpret each and every video as their own thing and what exactly each could symbolize. But for now, I just wanted to give this a shout out because I really love the art and I love the artist and I think the content is wonderful. So check it out. This last channel I'm going to mention is hard to explain. Sometimes I come across a channel that's more grounded on just someone who doesn't know how to YouTube or someone who likes to fill their page with rants or something of the sort. There are the artistic channels out there that are abstract, but then there are those channels that are strange for the personal aspect of it. This is one of those channels. Happier Journey is a channel that uploads pretty much daily, and on a glance, these videos seem pretty normal. Most of it is just vlog-style travel videos, nothing too special. Even the talking in the background isn't anything too special either. I mean, it, at least I don't think it is. I don't know, I don't speak Korean, but hey, maybe the guy making this video for one reason or another doesn't want to speak. Sure, that's reasonable, but where things get strange is, well, the sheer amount of videos this guy has uploaded. Seriously, almost like every single day he uploads at least twice. It's very frequent, even for a vlogging channel. Like really, how could we have so much footage to upload every single day? Well, okay. That's a little strange, but not impossible. It could be that he's just editing his own stuff and releases them whenever possible. But then we get to the titles of the video themselves. Most of these titles seem nonsensical and are splashed with an English title followed by Korean text, but these titles are often pretty confusing. Taking this one for example, which translated it reads, 988 Sego Big Dot Love, comma, Letter Yen Picks with like four X's, Resurrection, Canadian Rockies, Lake, Happier Journey. Okay, what? So I get the 988 part. It's just the number of logs he's uploaded thus far. Sometimes it's out of order, but that's what it means. And the love letter, well, well, we'll get to that in a bit. 
But what is Yen Pink's resurrection and Sego? Is that the guy's name or does that mean something? In fact, many of these titles relate to one another by two things or one. Either they're spiritual or Christian in nature, or they're love letters, which doesn't really correlate with the content of the videos, which is just a guy walking around and exploring Canada or driving around in his car in the Canadian wilds, as noted in the titles themselves. In fact, I was able to pinpoint exactly where in Canada this man had visited. When looking at 988, the man drives by a place called Crazy Creek Hot Pools Resort, which is found right here in Malacqua, British Columbia. So yes, these vlogs do take place within Canada, and likely this man, whoever he is, is just recording his vacation, or possibly he lives in Canada and is just driving around. Again, while many of these things are weird, there's nothing really underlying that tells us that they're nefarious or even worth exploring further. Let's face it, with trillions of hours of content uploaded weekly on YouTube, there are bound to be some boomers who don't really know how to edit or upload or title stuff exactly like this. It's really not that freaky. It's just like looking at a fucking boomer's Facebook page. It's the sort of shit you see all the time. Well, I say that, but in that very same video, 988 as I call it, there are some things that I have neglected to mention. First is the text to speech after the Korean voice is done talking. 20th of May, 2020, 8.01 a.m. What you eat in as your breakfast? Wish you can tell me before you go to bed. It's a love letter. In fact, the entire love letter can be found in the description of the video itself. And it reads like this. The 20th of May, 2020, 8.01 a.m. What you eat it as your breakfast? Wish you can tell me before you go to bed. Today it is 520 Valentine's Day. Do you know what is that meaning? 520 means I love you. I hope we can have sweet start in this day. How about a heart-shaped fried egg with two bread as your breakfast first? Oh. You can always tell me what you want to eat and what you like to eat. Don. T worry. Every morning will be a different breakfast for you. Here in XXX, a saying that if you want to get your man's heart, then get his stomach first. Will you like to be that man for me? I'm ready to catch your heart. You ready for you my delicious food and me? The 20th of May 2020, 8.08 a.m. Can I share some secret to you? Can I share our weekend? Now I am on my bed. Do you know here it is so cold. I need to have you in my life. Will you warm me up? I am serious to you. Don't dupe how much I can love you. I will show you my love over and over again. If you know that I truly love you, will you give me all your love? You are my everything. I will open up everything to you. If I know that I am loved by you, believe me, you will know my feelings through my passionate and sexy kiss. Will I get a reply from you? A kiss? Or a hot The 16th of September 2020. 1.58 p.m. I am awake at this inpatient ward in the hospital. I don't know how I affected the virus. I just feel sick have fever suddenly cannot take a breath in some moment. Maybe my health is not good. Enough to protect myself from the virus. These days I think about life and death a lot have you think about that before. Life is short. I think I work too hard I have not enjoy my life so much. I have much regret for my life, I am afraid I will. Leave here J try myself to keep on, but I am too weak. Did you have that feeling before? Feel the helpless? I try to hold my life but it is too hard, if I leave. Will you remember there is someone say these words to you? The 17th of September 2020 outside, the weather is sunny it seem that autumn is coming I can see the fallen leaves from the window when I am awake I try to see outside is there all the white in the isolation. Ward and just one or two doctor or nurses to come when it is time to check my situation here in the day or night. Can see someone cry or shout in the first two days, I am frightened about this hospital, but now I calm down life is crazy no one will know what happened in the next moment till last week. I never know would get the virus I never think about I would lay on this room all the time. I never know I cannot talk to anyone I cannot walk outside. Now I think I am in jail. No one can help no one can comb up any no one can conform me. I am sick, I am helpless. And I cannot cry. The 18th of September 2020, 3.28 am just now the doctor told me, I need change to another inpatient ward. My situation is much more worse. I think it is my last day to send you words. It is my last day stay here. I in another inpatient ward. I cannot have my phone or anything. I will close my profile. If I can go out the ward, 
I recover I will come back. But I am afraid I need say goodbye to you. You need be happy and I hope you can have right one to spend the rest life with you. You need the better one to take good care of you. There, I will think of you even in my last minute. Please enjoy the short life. Enjoy every day. September 2020, 1am I may not be the first woman in your life but I want to be the, the last woman in your life. I know I am not the one who first made you feel loved but I want to be the only one to make you feel loved soulful lly to the core of your heart. I promise to treat you the way you want to be treated and give you the respect you deserve. I promise to be always your lover and friend. I will pay attention and give you time. I love you. Dear Big thank you so much for your letter. Thank you for giving me such a precious chance to know you. I will cherish this chance to communicate with you more as I am very interested in you'll am serious to look for my lifelong partner here, how about you? Would you like to give me a permission to call you? As I feel talking on the phone will narrow our distance and make our hearts closer. I want to feel your breath, hear your voice and feel your heart race for me and mine for you. Now let me tell you something about myself. I am a quiet, romantic, loyal, optimistic, confident and considerate lady. Sometimes I am a little naughty. I hope one day can share my naughty ideas with you. I have a big dream that is one day I could hold my lover's hand to travel around the world. Would you like to hold my hand? I'm a traditional 4x lady. I love decent clothes. And in public, I can behave very properly, at home, I can create a warm and happy atmosphere, in the kitchen. I dot can cook delicious xxx cuisines in the bedroom, you can experience a sexy, romantic, and hot lady. Are you my Mr. Right? Do you like xxx food? Would you like to marry a 4x characteristic lady to be your wife? Would you please tell me more about your work and life? This is a weird love letter. What's confusing me as well is, well, I, I thought this was a love letter written by the creator of this channel, Happy as I'll call him from now on, but then the narrative changed. It got darker when the person writing the letter revealed they had a virus and had been taken to the hospital. Most likely they're talking about COVID-19 and it seems that their symptoms keep worsening to a point where they now write as if they're about to die, but then it suddenly changes. Now, the person writing is more flirtatious and seems to be more loving, as if nothing happened. But then it changes again to where the person is now talking as if they're nothing more than just some ad for an escort or porn website by saying things like, you can experience a sexy, romantic, and hot lady. Multiple times throughout this one letter, it felt like it was written by three or more different people, and keeping in mind that this is a love letter seems to be a bit dark and sort of robotic. The misspellings are also strange, and the censored words, the X's where there should be something, it's kind of like an online meet your match kind of survey than a love letter. And at one point I really thought that this was written by Happy himself, like he's writing himself a love letter or to someone else, which I think makes sense. Why? Well, Happy isn't vaccinated, as he proudly says in his profile picture. So it could explain what he meant by the virus, and it probably was him writing himself something or to someone a love letter while in the hospital, but I can't really tell. And though that had my curiosity, the edits in the video are ultimately what got my interest. Notice that on the far left corner in nearly all of Happy's videos, we see a collage of different photos passing by, each one most likely representing Happy himself, I can't quite understand why he does this, or if this has any sort of meaning whatsoever, but it's sort of freaky, especially when his black and white photo appears out of nowhere and is just staring straight at you. I get this might be a photo of him when he was like younger and maybe in school, but it's really not a good photo. But that's not the part that's weird, I mean it's strange, sure, but check this shit out. At multiple instances when the video transitions to a still image of a photo happy I assume took, there is a woman seen right next to him, which he adds. It's a tiny, minuscule cropped photo and it's extremely hard to see or even identify, but it's there and pops up if you look really closely. This happens frequently in 988 and doesn't really happen in other videos, though there are thousands and I haven't really, um, well, explored all of them. So it could have happened multiple times, but with this one video I found, I mean, it happens so frequently in the following timestamps. 302, a woman appears next to Happy's photo, seemingly wearing a red dress and looking at the camera. 445, 
the photo of a woman's head appears next to Happy. Again, probably a different woman, and to me, kind of looks like a mannequin. 545, another woman, this time overlaid on top of a photo of Happy. Extremely small this time, and really hard to tell just who this is. 648, this one is the hardest to see, and she's incredibly small, but pops in on top of this photo of Happy. I really can't discern what this photo even is, really. 745, a woman appears on top of Happy's hat. This one is extremely small, just like the others, and I think they're actually getting smaller. 822, this time two women appear next to the photos of Happy, possibly the same woman, honestly, but still weird as to why there's two pictures of the same woman. After this, Happy does this transition from video to still image one last time just after the love letter is done being read. It's a photo of a lake, much like the others, but this time it's tilted and the, I guess, romantic music that was playing in the background is now suddenly replaced with Beethoven's Moonlit Sonata. This is weird because in the previous shots, all of the photos have been small and presented normally, yet this transition to Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, a song that's pretty ominous in itself, followed by the crooked lake photo and the enlarged photo of Happy himself is just sort of unnerving. I don't know, it could just be me. I, I am writing this at around 3am with the lights off. At first I thought he didn't add a woman to this one part, but if you actually look very closely, I think you'd be able to see… something? I can't tell if it's a woman. Actually, I can't tell what it is at all. It's just there, and I'm not sure why. After this, the text-to-speech voice changes and speaks entirely in Korean. Obviously, I don't know Korean, so I can't translate anything, but using Google Translate, I got a bit of what was said here and there. Now keep in mind that these sound pretty ominous at first, but it's worth noting that these were translated using Google, so it can be totally inaccurate, added to the fact that the voice itself is drowned out by Moonlight Sonata blaring on top of it, so I encourage anyone who actually speaks Korean to watch these videos and see what you can make out. I would also show the part of the audio, but apparently Moonlight Sonata is copyrighted and I can't really show much. Sorry. All that strangeness that happens in that one video is not exclusive to that one video, mind you. But since there's over a thousand of these videos and counting, I can't really explore every single one. But from the ones I have watched, I can tell you the weirdness varies, but it's always there. For example, in 965, the love letter being read is by the same voice, but this time it's about a woman named Lena a passionate and affectionate and also tender loving woman as she says. She describes herself again much like a woman advertising herself would, asking the person she's writing the letter to what she would wear, asking the reader if they like the size of her breasts, the color of her panties, and she has a quote, magic tongue and fingers, unquote. At this point, I'm nearly convinced that these so-called love letters are more than likely the descriptions you'd find on an escort's website, or something like that, I don't know. Then around the 3 minute mark, the person writing this letter mentions an incident in Chicago and Texas, and asks the reader if they believe in rights for American citizens to have the right to bear arms. It's kinda political for a love letter, but also what the fuck? <laughs> like, were we just being flirty about sex shit now? All of a sudden it's like about American politics? Like, it's just so weird, I, I don't know what to make of it. Then it gets even more fucked up when the writer starts talking about a home invasion incident in which the woman's husband was assaulted by men in masks trying to rob them of their stuff. The writer even describes it as an incident that led her to believe that people can be worse than the devil. This is fucking part of the love letter. Like, what is this? I figured this would probably mean that my original theory of Happy writing his own love letters to be true, but why would he add this weird, dark detail into his love letter fantasy? Is he writing some sort of grandeur story to make it seem more fantastical than it really is? Because seriously, where are these women coming from? Better yet, where is he getting these so-called letters? Is he talking to these people? Is he just finding random stuff online? By the way, if I hadn't made this clear before, I can't show you these dialogues because of copyrighted music just blaring over the TTS itself, so you're just gonna have to watch it yourself. There are other oddities here and there, but again, there are over a thousand videos on this channel alone, and covering each and every one is 
pretty much impossible and time consuming and kind of pointless because a lot of them are pretty much the same slideshow kind of thing with weird nonsensical phrases and words just being thrown at the screen. Most of them follow the same formula, except for a few oddities, which I will cover briefly. So when I mention a formula, I mean that these videos usually focus on the quote unquote love letters, or they focus on happy spiritual viewpoints, which are often condensed into Christian values. And then there are videos like these, which translates to temporary first aid method for critical emergency patients 12 11 1 fractures injuries penetrating the eyes foreign objects in the eyes fainting fractures frostbite and freezing head injuries what the fuck the video then proceeds to instruct the viewer on how to treat someone with these kinds of wounds okay like is anybody really gonna like that's that's those are like very specific injuries what is this channel? Then there are personality tests, which I'll be honest, are nonsensical. I, I understand I'm working with Google Translate here, but I feel like there's nothing significant here to mull over. Like, they just sound like, you know, something your mom and dad post on Facebook. And like, it, it makes no sense. What's even stranger is this one video in which Happy actually doxes himself. Like, he literally shows a picture of where he lives from what looks like a Google Maps image. I really don't know why he did that. Another video actually shows him editing his videos for about an hour straight, which goes to show that these are not some content farm automated robot making these videos, it's actually someone who made thousands of videos and uploads them at about twice a day, which again brings up the question as to what he does for a living. I'd figure he'd be someone who travels a lot, but he uploads, like I said, twice a day, mainly 20 or so minute videos. And he dedicates a lot of his time focusing on just this channel, and really for what? But now let's go back to some of the other freaky videos, mainly this one called New Face. The Korean here also translates to New Face as well. And it's just a slideshow of this one woman with Happy's photos. Now I figured that maybe this was someone Happy knew, maybe his wife, maybe his daughter. But when I look up these photos, there's no results whatsoever. However, I really doubt that this is someone Happy actually knows, and I figure it's someone he admires a lot, maybe even romanticizes over, as the slideshow seems to be telling a story, and with the music playing in the background, I'd assume it's some sort of music video slideshow thing. Wow. I'm a wordsmith, aren't I? Music video slideshow thing. In any case, we never really see these two together, that being the mystery woman and Happy himself. There's no photo of them physically together, and the photos taken of her seem way too high quality, making me assume that this might be some sort of model or actress. And before I get attacked in the comments, look, I don't know shit about like Korean pop culture, so please just be patient with my ignorance. At any rate, the thing that makes this really, well, freaky is that the preview in the timeline in this video shows her face blurred out, yet in the video, they're completely uncensored. It's just kind of weird. Oh, yeah, and he's got UFO videos. No shit. He, he just has, like, real UFO footage. And I gotta say, as far as UFO videos go, this one's really compelling. Yeah. Look, I, like, I don't want to gloss over this, but seriously, what the fuck am I supposed to say about this? I just stumbled upon it while looking through his channel. Like, he has UFO footage. Like, the dude caught some actual UFOs. That's crazy. So now we have these strange videos, these strange love letters, these strange edits, these strange photos, the fucking UFOs. How could we interpret what this all means? Well, for starters, it's not an ARG, because I, I swear to God someone in the comments is going to say that. But more seriously, and less fantastically, I guess, it's likely just an old boomer who's just posting basic Facebook videos on his YouTube account. There's really nothing to suggest he's dangerous to anyone, but it's likely he might be a lonely guy looking for love, or maybe some sort of attention. I still can't explain where these so-called love letters are coming from. Most likely they're from a website he found, like a dating one, and just copy and pasted them for his videos. Still, that doesn't explain the horror stories such as the home invasion one and the hospital stories, but honestly, tons of YouTube channels exist that are just like Happy's, made by people who just want an outlet and want to express themselves. I don't know what to think of Happy as an individual, 
but it's likely he's not really at risk of harming anyone. It's just one of those strange channels that sort of exists on YouTube, one of millions, I'd say. One that has no real objective or goal, but is run by someone with a lot of time, and really there's no need to criticize them for that. Maybe there's a chance that Happy isn't really all up there anymore, but hey, if he's not hurting anyone and he just wants to express himself and you know, honestly, he doesn't even get that many views, so even if he had toxic viewpoints, he probably doesn't even have a following anyways. Just let him do what he wants. I must have seen hundreds of ARGs in online horror by now, but every now and again, I find something that reminds me of why I love online horror in general. I'm not exaggerating when I say that I am incredibly excited to show you Lacey's Wardrobe. I, well, holy shit, that sounds really perverse. Lacey's Wardrobe is a quote unquote lost flash game from the 2000s that's about a girl named Lacey. She's got a busy day and it's up to players like you to figure out what she's got to wear for her evening outing. Do people say outing anymore? At any rate, it's pretty emblematic of Flash games back in the day that involved, well, dressing your favorite characters up in cute clothing. You know the ones. No, not, not those. Jesus Christ, not those. Yeah, those. Well, anyways, it's pretty accurate to old games. Like, it's extremely convincing. And if I hadn't known that this was created by someone, I would have thought it'd be a real Flash game from the past. And by someone, I mean like, you know, someone for a horror, well, whatever, anyways. But things are a bit off once the player actually dresses up Lacey for her picnic meetup. Take a look. You might not notice it at first, but a face can be seen hiding in the bushes, watching Lacey as she's near her picnic. The words, I love you, Lacey, can be seen for a split second. Then we're back here. It's evening now. The music seems a little off, and Lacey has to get ready to meet her friends at the mall. Again, the player dresses her up, but something interrupts the gameplay. After dressing up Lacey, we see her go to the mall, but after what we had just heard and seen, we know things aren't going to be normal when we get back home. Now things are getting intense, but they get even more intense after this. Now I do want to stress that this little video is possibly one of the best horror videos I've ever seen in a long time, like by far. So if you want to be unspoiled and watch the rest yourself, skip to this timestamp and I'll talk about the next video. Seriously, watch it yourself to really get the full impact on what's going to happen next. I'll give you a moment. Okay, ready? Well, here we go. Lacey then gets ready for her night outing with her handsome crush, but as the player dresses her up slowly, we see Lacey doing her best attempts at stopping the player from allowing her to leave. Unfortunately, it's too late, and Lacey then meets her doom, which... I can't show on YouTube because of how graphic the imagery is, but the ending is still just unsettling enough to fill in the gaps as to what happened. Sorry, did I say fill in the gaps? More like flat out tells you what happens. Then we're back at the start. Yeah, so this video alone, y'all, this fucking video rejuvenated my love for the online horror medium. I mean, seriously, I've seen it all and I've made fun of it all on my streams. But this is the first time 
in a long time that something actually scared me. And not only that, but just shocked me. It did everything right. It designed itself perfectly. The art, the setting, the sound effects, the gameplay. I mean, it was all done beautifully. And while you can argue that the art inspirations are from here and there, it can't be denied that amongst the sea of ARGs and analog horrors, this one stands out beautifully. By the way, before anyone asks, no, it's not an ARG. It's not even close. It's far as I can tell anyways, most likely just a small little mini horror series. Yet the fun doesn't end there, as Lacey has yet another misadventure, one where she tries to run her own restaurant. This one is far more elaborate and, can you believe it, a ton more disturbing. Now, I do want to warn everyone who are more sensitive in the audience watching at home right now that the next video features graphic scenes of violence, self-harm, ideations of death, and other extremely dark topics. Not kidding when I say that this is actually a lot darker and really, really disturbing. So, if you're not comfortable with that, then I suggest clicking this timestamp to avoid all of that and get to the main discussion. They'll be warned, because of how prevalent those uh, themes are at the main story, there might just not be any way to actually avoid said topic, and there's a chance that I'd still have to mention it. This one is called Lacey's Diner. Featuring, of course, Lacey. But this time around, the player now has a name, Char Char887. And in this video, they tell the audience about a secret ending that they thought was freaky. Much like the previous game, the video is very convincing and passing off as a flash game. Even the editing itself is very reminiscent to late 2000s and early 2010s YouTube style of editing. The narrator explains that, though the game seems normal, things seem to be a bit strange once the timer runs out. Now again, I can't stress enough that these videos are wonderfully made and honestly really refreshing in terms of new takes on online horror, so I highly, highly recommend watching these videos before you watch me spoil all the horror stuff. But hey, if you don't want to do that, that's fine. I just personally think you'd do yourself a favor by watching the video. Anyways, let's continue. As the timer runs out, we see this. Now, nothing too terrible, sure, and the game continues as normal, demonstrated by the player, but what happens if we actually let the timer run all the way down? I have three hours of sleep, I can't fucking do this recording. The customers are gone, and Lacey is seen back at home, screaming, calling herself names, or perhaps is being called names by someone else. The photo at a glance isn't really all that scary, if anything it's very, well, edgy, a little tryhard, if I were to be completely honest, but looking at the background itself, well, it almost seems like a real crime photo as blood is splattered all over the walls, and the photo taken is at such a low quality, it almost seems like it was taken by someone who had just caught the scene of a violent crime as it happened. June 29th, 2006. That's the date captured on the bottom right. Don't know if this is relevant yet, but it does give us a timestamp as to when this whole thing took down. We also see photos of Lacey's restaurant, as well as pictures around the town, seemingly as a way to narrate Lacey's movements, going farther and farther away from her diner, as she states that this diner is all she has, and if it fails, well, she has no other option than to end it all. Char Char then skips to the second day, and again, waits for the timer to run out, and here's what happens. The 
The few images that scatter by are pretty hard to read, and to be honest, even with a bit of fuckery here and there, I honestly wasn't able to make much sense of it. Leave a comment down below if you really think you know what it says or if you found a way to read it, but from what I could visibly read, the first image has Lacey, looking somewhat like a cadaver, and the text mentioning something about death row and a body being pulled out of the river, a dead body to be precise. I mean. I, I don't think I needed to clarify that, but I think I did. Everything else, well, it's just too murky and grainy to read, if I have to be honest. The next image shows a house, possibly Lacey's, new or old. The text above is very clear, and you'll notice that there's an angry looking person, again possibly Lacey, staring at you. The text reads, while it was still twitching, for memories are no substitute. Part of the ingrained paranoia was owed directly to the fact that they used to teach kids such perverse little bizarre lies that they passed off as the truth. It seems like this might be an excerpt from a book, as to which book it is I'm not totally certain, but it seems like the narrator, whoever they might be, is rather harsh towards adult figures of their life for spoon feeding them info that led them to believe that their life would be easy, possibly because they were told that they were special. Though, that is just my personal speculation, honestly, as it fits somewhat with Lacey's morality being led by her successes in life and the failures as well. This leads to Lacey having a breakdown, leading her to spiral into despair and forcing her to do some irrational and dangerous things. The next day, we get this. As she adds ingredients, each one describes a bit about herself, I assume so anyways, and all the abuse she's faced in her life, and all the trauma she ever faced. Cigarette butts, possibly indicating burns she received from a man who she just refers to as him, whom she almost cried in front of and never wanted to again. Cockroaches that swarmed her room, crawling everywhere, making her want to end it all right then and there. Not safe for work stuff. Yeah, sorry, I can't say that naughty, naughty, no, no word. This one entry being hard to read because of the static, but through this, we get the mention of an uncle and how he must have been addicted to this sort of thing, constantly living in his own fantasy world where women find him desirable. The uncle who must have been Lacey's abuser. The meth used in the bowl has no real discernible dialogue or words, but does it really need any of that? It does contain strange images, and seeing as how this is all showing Lacey's trauma and abuse, it is possible that Lacey has a substance abuse problem, the substance of course being meth. The used condom, well I don't think you need much imagination to get what that represents. The person Lacey refers to as him returns, and since we know of an uncle existing, we can make the assumption that this was her uncle, and that, well, he did some things to her. And honestly, the wording is pretty subtle, but graphic all the same. Describing Lacey's experience with her uncle, I think I'll let you decipher what this means. Broken glass is also added to the bowl, most likely from the times her uncle broke things out of anger, perhaps, or, more likely, the shards of glass that she could have used on herself. Finally, the distorted visage of a man, which she also adds to the bowl. While the bowl itself seems to have no name, unlike the rest, we can see at the bottom right the letters U and N, most likely meaning uncle. And then we see this. And so comes to the next part, serving the dish to the customers, and, well, here's what happens. Once that scene ends, we see the diner is now closed due to sanitary reasons, and so Lacey goes through with her alternative plans.
With this, the video ends as Char Char exclaims to the audience that they're trying to find more Lacey games and see if there's more to the story and what else these games made by Cyanoso games holds within them. Sorry, I couldn't say that right. Cyanoso? Cyanoso? Whatever. Cyanoso, by the way, doesn't mean anything, but the spelling is dangerously close to cyanosis, which is a condition that affects certain people when there's poor or no circulation going through the body, notably in toes and fingers, which is caused by numerous things. That could be something of note, or it could not be. I don't know. Just thought I'd mention that. Of course, I just can't ignore the strange flashes at the end of the video. All three images will be shown right here, with one of them being blurred out, just in case. I don't know, YouTube can be really weird sometimes. As we can see, two of these images are practically identical. There's one that shows what appears to be a girl strapped to her chair, right in front of her desktop. Some of the wires seemingly piercing through her skin as blood flows down. The image that's currently blurred shows a close-up of their arm, being stabbed by the same wires. It's almost as if this girl is literally hooked up to the PC herself. Maybe some sort of symbolic gesture of some sort, or perhaps it's literal. The final frame being almost exactly like the first frame talked about, but just zoomed in and with the text that reads, I'm in heaven. The video then ends here. So, with all this info gathered, and all the info dumped by the game itself, I think it's, well, safe to assume that Lacey just doesn't exist, because the story being told through their Flash games aren't the story of Lacey at all. It's of whoever this girl is. I think this girl is the real life Lacey, whatever her real name may be. I think she's been trickling out info since the late to mid 2000s, but hid them in a way so that not to draw attention to themselves. Keep in mind, this is supposed to be a quote unquote lost game that was just recently found by Char Char. And even then, taking on the game normally would pretty much result in, well, nothing. But ironically, doing nothing is what will lead you to something that gives you a hint on what the real world Lacey is going through. Though sadly, whoever this girl is, the original creator of Lacey, is probably no longer around. Because if these games were made from sometime in 2000s, 2005, 2006, chances are they've been asking for help for a very long time. And nobody has been able to answer them until just now, when it's probably too late. I'm in heaven is the creator's final words. Or maybe it wasn't that they were seeking help, but rather seeking a way to be remembered for the shit that they had to deal with. The abuse, the trauma, the scars, it couldn't be healed. So her only way was for her to show the world that she was someone who was worth a damn. Someone who made cutesy flash games that portrayed her own life to whomever played the game. Sadly, this might be their very last message. And that is, of course, until we find the next game. So damn, that's heavy, and it does seem like the creator of this channel is working on newer Lacey videos, which is great, honestly. I think what's been shown here shows a lot of potential, and I honestly can't wait to see what happens next. Though, again, this might be a little too graphic for some people out there, and thankfully they already put up trigger warnings for anyone sensitive to these topics, which is very useful for anyone who doesn't really feel like they're in the mood for that sort of stuff. I understand when it comes to horror that deals with more graphic or hardcore subjects, people tend to get a bit cynical, or or perhaps find the stories insensitive. I, however, still support the idea of horror being unrestricted. So long as the medium isn't exploitive or compromises anyone's well-being, I think anyone is allowed to talk about these sorts of subjects, heavy or not, and ultimately, it's up to you, the viewer, if it's worth your time. And so far, Lacey's series is definitely worth your time. Go subscribe to Ghost Tundra, give them some love in the comments, and get ready for what's coming next. People often get the wrong idea about me when it comes to my opinions on analog horror. I have, and probably always will, love analog horror. I love that so many people have rediscovered this sort of mockumentary style of horror that I grew up with and are making their own versions of said horror with a new audience. However, analog horror is tricky to really nail down. Sometimes you just gotta ask yourself, what does the VHS filter really add? Like, this is cool and all, and well thought out, but does it need to be analog? When you really think about it, the answer is often no, it doesn't. And so analog horror has become this easy out for most people, a way to just make things instantly spooky because, well, 
old things are spooky, I guess. But the Faraway Logs finds a way to reincorporate that style and use it not as a crutch, but as an important way to move the narrative. Right off the bat, yes, this is based on Omori. And if you haven't played Omori, this is definitely going to have some heavy contextual spoilers. Although, I guess if you haven't played Omori, you probably wouldn't even get what most of the spoilers are, without the context, of course. Still, I would recommend playing the game if you're interested in it, and probably not watching the series, should you not want to get any spoilers whatsoever. Though, I think it's safe to watch it, even if you don't know what Omori is, or if you are interested in playing Omori sometime in the future. Now, you might be wondering why I'm covering something that's just clearly a fan project, and not something, I guess, original. Well, shut the fuck up! And I'll tell you, Faraway Logs fucking rocks! Note, I will be talking about Faraway Logs, and if you already know what Omori is and who the characters are, I will try my best not to spoil anything for the first time players, though that might be unavailable. Despite it being based on an already existing IP, the way it respects the source material by not only copying its style, but also emulating perfectly the horror elements of Omori is wonderful, as well as the fact that this was all made by one person. It's just so impressive. Not only that, but the VHS camera is also very well done. Like I totally believe this was filmed by some kids who just got a camcorder. And the voice acting, while it may seem awkward at first, makes sense. This is through Basil's perspective, or Basil, I don't know how to say that, I'm just gonna say Basil. A shy kid who doesn't really know how to talk very well. Actually, not just Basil, like, everyone sounds perfect, honestly. They all sound like kids and teens, it's very well done. But aside from the aesthetic being perfectly done, what is it about this series that really makes it stand out? Well, if you already know what makes Omori scary, then you already know what lies underneath the dark side of these videos. And if you don't, well, don't worry. There's plenty of opportunities for you to find out just by watching these videos. The first two videos are normal as normal can be. Basil introducing the world to his friends, Sunny and Aubrey, as the trio walks down the neighborhood. Nothing too special happens here. The date is something to take note of, but only if you're really an Omori fan, you already know the lore. I'm sorry, I know I'm being vague, by the way. I, I really don't want to spoil anything for anyone who hasn't played Omori. Either way, if you're in the know, you're in the know. The third video, Tor, is of note for a couple of reasons, but mainly because of how perfect it replicates the home from the game. It honestly kind of surprises me how well done it is, and it shows the amount of love and care the creator has put into the project. I don't know, something I wanted to point out and, and just give a little respect to. Also, I can't help but laugh at the moments the video cuts off, because dude, like every kid who had a camcorder just sucked ass at pressing the record button. Like I know when I had a camcorder, I just pressed record on like every small moment that I thought was interesting, only to end up with like a three second footage of grass or some shit, and it's like, why the fuck did I record this? The next video, Hi Mari, just hones in on this sentiment as it's just a 20 second video of the group just relaxing under the tree, and, well, I, I just can't help but feel, honestly, kind of nostalgic, which is awesome, really. Not a lot of analog horror gives me that feeling. I mean, how could it, really? No offense to those who make analog horror, but most of them usually don't really pay attention to the nuances of the era they're trying to replicate, often leading to the replication being very artificial and very forced or misunderstood, not emblematic of the format they're trying to copy from. So seeing an actual nostalgic feeling like piece of analog horror is just so refreshing and just wonderful. The wonder, however, soon dies down with the next video, though, Meet My Friends starts off normal with the official introductions of Sunny, Aubrey, Hero, and Kel. Things kind of steer off. Oh, Basil, is that a camcorder? Camcorder? Yeah. Okay, wait, hang on. Sorry, can I can I point this out really quick? The audio is fucking peak. Like seriously, this part where Hero is far away and his voice is just like barely audible. Like, oh my god, I don't know what a bit. I, like the attention to detail, it just makes me. Ugh. Anyway, at the last frame of this video, we see faded letters. A string of letters that, when added to the YouTube URL, leads us to this. The description reads, everything is going to be okay. Now I wonder what that could mean. With this being revealed, the next video, Unfinished Treehouse, shows Basil exploring, well, the treehouse. Things escalate a bit as there's periodic flashes of text that appear on screen every now and again, but we'll look at that later. 
As Basil goes down and walks with Sonny, they talk about Dorian Gray. I'd assume the portrait of Dorian Gray, and I swear to God I'm having a Mandela catalog effect or something, because I really could have sworn the book was called The Portrait of Dorian Gray, not The Picture of Dorian Gray or whatever. Anyways, if you've read Dorian Gray, you probably already know that there's a bit of symbolism with this reference in itself. But if you don't, essentially it's a book about a beautiful man named Dorian Gray who sells his soul in order to stay young and beautiful forever. In place for his soul, a painting of himself drawn by his friend and admirer for his beauty, Basil Hallward, ages instead of him. All while Dorian Gray lives out his life hedonistically, the painting changes and warps according to Dorian Gray's sins and reflects his true ugliness. Obviously, there's a lot more symbolism hiding underneath the surface level summary, but I won't get too deep into that as the strange thing about this Dorian Gray, I don't know, shout out, is, well, it doesn't really talk about Dorian Gray's portrait or the story itself. It's actually framing Dorian Gray as an author who wrote an unknown book about criminals who try to fake their own death in order to get away with a crime, which to my knowledge just doesn't exist. But just before the description of the book comes up, we see this. Something. Speaking of something, the flashes mentioned previously happens three times. 15 seconds, 52 seconds, 1 minute, 35 seconds. Combine these letters and input them into the URL and we get sent to this. Something. Speaking of, during the first appearance of this something, the video slightly lags just a bit a second or two later, then it changes the date and time into a new URL code. Input the code, and we get this video. It's hard to see, but you can see it if you brighten up the image a bit. There in the darkness, you can see something standing before you. But aside from something hiding in the darkness, there too is something hiding with the audio itself, not just in this video, but in the video previously shown. First, let's listen to the audio as presented in this video. Now, let's speed it up 20 times. Cool, huh? Well, it gets sneakier than that, because if we take this audio and make it into a spectrogram, people have reportedly said that it makes an image. Now, this is somewhat debatable, as some have claimed that it's supposed to represent musical notes, and yeah, I can see that, kinda, but it's so grainy and really short that I can't honestly confidently say that that is what it is. Though, matching up the songs with the notes do seem to align, so it is likely that, and given the nature of Omori and what this scene represents, I won't be surprised if that is really the answer. Some others have claimed that this is actually the song Help Me, but I'm having a really hard time hearing it. Take a listen for yourself and tell me what you think. But with all that being said, that ultimately takes us to the end of Faraway Logs, at least for now. There's some updates that have yet to make their way into the video series as of right now that you can see on Jake's community tab, but as to when they'll be uploaded again or when they feel like uploading is up in the air, and honestly, they should just take their time. Though again, I highly recommend watching the series for yourself and to subscribe to Jake as I honestly think this series is going to be amazing. I mean, it already is, but I'm excited to see what comes next. As for Omori the video game, again, it's totally up to you as to whether or not you want to play the game. I certainly think the story was phenomenal and totally worth it but if you wanted to get into this series then it's definitely kind of mandatory but if you want to go in blind well I, I think you can definitely do that it's gonna take you into a roller coaster you probably never expected but hey it's still a roller coaster right 
Still, much of the spoilery and obvious stuff is most likely going to be discussed in the comments, so I highly advise staying away from that if you don't want to be spoiled early. Whatever comes next for these two content creators is ultimately up to them. But whatever may come of their work, I'll be sure to keep up with them till the end. And I hope you do too. Starting off with some classic analog horror content, Greylock is currently one of the creepiest analog horror out there with some genuinely interesting lore and fascinating visuals. It does repeat some all too familiar tropes that many analog horror recycle, but I think there's enough here that is strong on its own that most can kind of ignore the rest. And honestly, most of it just sort of feels like a tribute to those great and wonderful content creators that have made such classic analog horrors, but we'll talk about that at the end of this little dissection that I'm about to do. Created by Rob Gavigan and co-produced by Matt Reeves, the series is sort of all over the place, with many of the tapes, i.e. videos, not chronologically numbered, but rather their individual tapes with several themes and segments, story beats that ultimately connect to each other in some way, shape, or form, rather than chronology. Clearly, there is a narrative to be told, but this series doesn't really make it easy to figure out what it is everything all of this is about, with so much of it still being fresh and new, as well as some of the series being so cryptic in nature. Now, as I said, this series started a few months ago and much of the info I will share with you now might change or may have a different meaning later down the line in the series lifespan, so Instead of solving every little detail shown to us through these tapes, I will instead opt for dissecting these tapes one by one and attaching each new bit of lore that fits with one another whenever possible. Sound good? Right, okay, well, let's start with... Someone is hacking into a laboratory, security cams are active and capture this activity but finds nothing. Many of the cameras shot are confusing and blurry. The computer states what's happening as the hacker gains administrator access despite not having a proper username. Data from this lab is getting extracted and at the end, the logo of Simeodyne USA is shown. Even after watching all these videos, it's currently unclear if this means that data was extracted to Simeodyne or if it was extracted from Simeodyne. Either way, not much can really be gathered from this one tape, although it sets up pretty much the premise of where these tapes came from, this one lab that were pretty much stealing the information from. So all the tapes you see from now on are just confidential tapes that have been released by a whistleblower. Who the whistleblower is, is currently unknown. But from that, we move on to... Tape zero zero two. Believers, when men pursue evil, it is evil that they will find. Mark my word. This tape features dashcam footage that leads us all the way into a dark forest. The radio is playing a sermon, talking about how man should stray away from the devil's temptation. A man holding a camera is seen traveling deep into the woods. He spots blood in the snow. Suddenly, the camera warps into what seems like a new reality. The blood leads to a tree. All the while, we hear an almost inaudible voice speaking to us. There are flashes that show us one side of reality to the next, then it all cuts to black and we're back on the road. The sermon continuing, the car getting slower, the surrounding area getting darker, and suddenly, a knock. The 
car drives faster, the sermon gets slower, more demonic, repeating phrases about the devil. And then it stops abruptly. We now get some background on what it is Simeo Dine USA is, or rather was, their main objective, and the overall lore of Greylock. We're told of Project Stargate, which is the collaboration between Simeo Dine USA and the US Army, specifically Unit 13. The current objective for Project Stargate is to find a way to use thought forms, which are beings manifested through psychokinesis, sort of like stands in JoJo, or as some people call them, tulpas. But they're just, let's be real, they're, they're stands, really, come on. Actually, I'd rather not be reductive. I do like the way they approach the topic of tulpas, as it is common in these kinds of stories to, to sort of just like make up shit and like fluff up stuff that doesn't really make sense in order to make it seem spooky. But in this, I really don't mind it. They have some really interesting ideas as to what they are, tulpas that is, and what we think of them, as well as what they could possibly be. You should watch the video yourself, should you be curious on the more in-depth details that Project Stargate is all about. However, moving on, the people behind Project Stargate have requested the help of a prominent figure in the scientific Tulpa community, a man by the name of Dr. Bernard Hayes. Through their hard work, they've created the Thought Form Manifester, making it easier for people to reach into their minds and manifest thought forms into reality, as the name suggests. Duh. What's really cool is there is apparently a sort of like prison for these thought forms that just sort of exists within this facility. The prison makes sure that the thought forms don't exit through the walls and what do these thought forms look like by the way? Well, it's all up to the imagination really. They can come out as anything and that could lead to some horrifying results that we might see later on. This tape is particularly sinister for many reasons, but without the right context, we can't really understand what's happening here. Though the context won't be given until a bit later, we can at least analyze what's happening here. Someone, possibly a group of people, wait outside someone else's home. They stalk around, checking inside, until they successfully infiltrate the home. And then this happens. our current program at the request of the Massachusetts State Police. Soon after, we see an emergency broadcast alert warning everyone of hungry home invaders coming after your third graders. The broadcast is specifically meant for families that live within Berkshire County, Massachusetts, where most of this story takes place. After this message, something rather horrifying happens. Check a look. Rad. Well, hello again, Tiffany. Oh, hi, Wanda. Nice to see you. This one's pretty short, but confusing if you haven't been paying attention up until this point. We see the ultrasound of a pregnant woman as the baby in her womb suddenly disappears. 
Just before the disappearance, we see two odd images that flash by. A newspaper clip stating the bizarre happenings in Berkshire County, and unfortunately the small print is practically impossible to read, so no help there. And then there's this face. Ooh. Now, the disappearance of this baby is terrifying, not just in concept, but what it sort of opens up to mean in the grand scheme of things, at least in this story. The participants in Project Stargate were all adults, presumably so, and these are adults with families. What if it's possible that the thought form manifester didn't just do its job correctly? What if instead of just manifesting thought forms, it actually gave the user the ability to manifest any thought forms at will without aid of the machine? After all, there are side effects when using the manifester, none too disturbing or noteworthy, but regardless, these side effects can last upwards to 72 hours. With the device being an experimental machine, it's not too far-fetched to think that maybe there are unknown side effects to this machine one that could potentially unlock thought form manifestation outside of the machine. In any case, could it be possible that either parent of this child could have manifested the baby, and when the baby was finally seen, it disappeared, regressing back to the manifester's mind, or perhaps even escaping the womb? It is, after all, only a ghost. Or stand. Though it's also worth noting rather interesting theories that some users have thought up. Remember previously that all throughout Berkshire County were heard screaming? Well, some commentators had noted that the screaming sounded like either that of children or of women. Or perhaps both. Is it possible that the quote-unquote participants of Project Stargate were actually forced to do this? Kidnapped from their own homes and made to manifest thought forms against their will? Do any of them even remember that? Well, let's keep moving forward and we might get the answers to that. Humanity has stood tirelessly in past two of great new trials of the 1840s to achieve one singular good. Starting off right out of the bat with a rather evil sounding symposium by Dr. Bernard T. Hayes, we learn just how ambitious he is about his experiments and research. It goes back to the theming of this whole shebang, the theme of humans poking at the lion's den for more, leading ourselves to self-destruction and the pursuit of knowledge and godlihood. And this is when things get really fucking interesting. Welcome to Simeodyne USA's Virtual Message Assistant, for user, Project Director, Frank Porter. We find the director of this project is Frank Porter, a name I don't think has been brought up previously, but it's a name being used now to play back some messages received by Paul Morelli, a miner from the Morelli Construction and Mining Company. Now, by used, I mean the person who is accessing these files is not Frank Porter, but rather using his name and credentials in order to obtain this otherwise confidential information. I know this because when the machine asks for the password, this is immediately bypassed via permission given by what the machine thinks is the system's administrator. Welcome back, user. Frank Porter. Please enter your credentials. Credential requirement bypassed by system administrator. Greetings, unknown user ID. They're only known as unknown user ID. We really don't know who's actually hacking into these files. But in any case, Paul Morelli informs Frank that though things are going smoothly, the miners had reportedly found man-made tunnels that seem ancient. And though they ultimately left it alone, Paul remarked that the tunnels seemed to have working lights and that after a few more of his men explored a bit deeper, they found ancient artifacts. Though, this would ultimately be a mistake, as the crew had progressively grown weaker and had oddly gotten sick from... something. Their food had also gotten bad, almost randomly. Freshly bought produce just seemed to grow maggots overnight. Around the same time, a strange figure had been seen within the woods near the mountains that they had been mining. It wasn't clear who or what it was, but the men described the strange figure as some really tall man. Paul hadn't seen this tall man at first, but eventually he did. It had a face. Walking around in the tree lot. I swear it had a face. Anyways, just, just call me back as soon as you can, Frank. 
Paul, audibly shaken by this encounter, decided to put up hunting cameras around the forest, and that's when this unfolds. After this, Frank makes one final audible call. And listen, I don't know how much of this project's dick I gotta suck for you to check it out, but if you don't want spoilers as to what happens at the end of this tape and experience it on your own, then skip to this timestamp. Otherwise, I'm about to show you one of the coolest and spookiest fucking sequences I've seen in an analog horror in a long time. So please, check it out if you want. Otherwise, sit back and enjoy the last few moments of this video. I feel like I need to figure out what's down there. I think whatever's down there could help my crew. But most of all, I feel like something really bad's gonna happen if I don't go down. So I'll be going down tonight. Message 9. March 30th. Time unavailable. Rad. Authorities continue to investigate the recent crime wave that swept across northern Berkshire County. A news reporter talking about the previous kidnapping incidents that occurred in Tape 004 is apparently attributed to an anti-American militia group, and as the tape ends, we'll see the words liar superimposed on the tape by what we'll learn later on to be a hijacker. Obviously, this whole militia story is a cover-up, but the cover-up goes deeper as we see a brief flash of a newspaper that apparently shows that the people around the area have started growing extra limbs, growing out teeth from their scalps, and developing severe psychosis. The area in question, of course, being Berkshire County. By the way, this name is going to be important later on, but let's move on. This is then followed up by a flash of the parents whom we assume belong to the disappearing baby in tape 005. Well, I don't think we could just say assume, we flat out know that this is Tiffany Crisaldi, as her name is mentioned in tape 005, just towards the end of the whole video. And here we see her name and face once again. One last thing to note before we move on to the next tape, is that this police officer's interview kind of gives away something pretty important. Look behind them. Mount Greylock. This is a real location in Massachusetts, and I'd like to remind everyone that this so far is not an ARG, but rather an analog horror alone. And I'm saying this because I'd really hate it if people just started visiting the area and calling up local joints just to find clues to a story that has so far not asked for audience participation. You might think that's totally unnecessary for me to say, but uh, you know, so why is this important? Other than it being the name of the series and all that, well, for starters, it's the cause of everything. Remember the mining those suckers did in Tape 006? They mentioned they were digging in an unspecified mountain. 
But here, we're given a blatant answer. This is a mountain that belongs in Massachusetts, and the series is naming itself after this mountain. So, with all that added up, we can now assume with confidence that this is actually where everything is happening. After all, if you actually look at the mountain in Google Maps, it is right next to Berkshire County, the real life one. This horrendous stuff that's happening to the people within this county has always been attributed to Mount Greylock. Something was awoken in this mountain and it's causing havoc to everyone nearby. Everyone within this area is going to face some horrible Pharaoh's curse like shit if they haven't already. After all, this story happens in the late 80s, maybe even sometime in the early 90s. And I say this because we really don't know how much of the Greylock incident has been covered up and for how long. We don't even know how much of Berkshire has been affected by this. We just know that there are some horrible mutations and strange paranormal events happening around the area, but that's sort of been drip fed to us. There could be more stuff that has sort of been hidden underground, purposely so. But we get a more deeper explanation with... The tape starts off where the previous tape left off, showing us the broadcast network executives arguing on how the channel had been hijacked, acknowledging the end of tape 007, and trying to understand what happened. Don, the host of his own show, Don Wright Tonight, could not be contacted. With this in mind, Liam Hollander, one of the execs, then goes looking for him at his own home. We'll get to that in a moment. Afterwards, we get a personal log created by Arnold Eugene Rivers, an anthropologist and archaeologist hired by the CD figures behind Project Stargate, which he refers to the Greylock Project, confusingly enough, but that's probably because the Greylock Project is more about the mining and excavation instead of the Tulpa stuff that Project Stargate is more focused on. Though, don't be fooled, these two are connected with each other. He largely notes the strange artifacts and various other ancient items found within Greylock's mines and tunnels, all of which come from several different cultures and religions, stemming from Mesoamerican to Paleoamerican, to even much farther cultures such as Egyptian, Viking, Spanish, etc. Those cultures and more who have some sort of artifact within these tunnels are mentioned, though why they're there or what this means is largely unknown. But Arnold hypothesizes that all these items were given to this mountain, this deep into this mountain, as... We then briefly see more of WRAV's programming. The show that was on briefly was called Cosmic Mysteries, which at this point was giving us a brief lesson on how the Earth and the Moon were born. Not much can be said here, except for this brief staticky part. Kind of looks like, I don't know, a face. I mean, doesn't it? No. But if that really is a face, then this whole little history lesson on how the moon and Earth kind of collided and created each other is probably hinting at what exactly is happening here in this story. But for now, we'll be moving on from this, mainly because I don't have any evidence moving forward from what I've seen that sort of connects these two together. But from there on, we hear a disturbing phone call made by Liam Hollander, where he had found his coworker Don Wright and his own home. Hill Road in Adams, uh, number 491. 491 Parker Hill Road, is that right? Yes. Okay, can you tell me, is anybody hurt? Liam, are you still with me? Is anybody hurt? <laughs> From here, Arnold continues to explain more of what was found in the tunnels, all the strange oddities of the tunnels themselves, how these cultures and people of history must have worshipped something in this mountain, something that they all feared. It's unknown what, but... Arnold definitely feels like there is something there, and it's beginning to gnaw at his mind. Huh. You know, this, this is really starting to remind me of At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft. Y'all ever read that? But you should. Or you could just watch Mouth of Madness if you want something good. <laughs> Man, 
H.P. Lovecraft. So what an overrated motherfucker. Afterwards, we get to see what exactly happened to the crew that were part of Project Greylock. All of them have been physically deformed and or suffering a severe amount of psychosis. Some have it way worse than others, transforming themselves into what are essentially ghouls or straight up SCPs in some manners. This dude can spit up acid like fucking Reptile from Mortal Kombat. That's the illest shit I heard, but tragic, I guess. Arnold continues on being thankful that he wasn't affected like the rest of the crew, but has noted a sense a paranoia has developed in himself because now he's pretty much terrified of being caught as he is now a whistleblower trying to unveil the truth of what happened on Mount Greylock. Going so far as to hiring a private eye to investigate what he has told him. The same one mentioned, by the way, in tape 007 when the newspaper flashed up on screen. Jim Melgren. Just as Arnold feels relieved to get this all off his chest, he hears a noise. And realizing that this is an analog horror series, he frantically looks for his camcorder. <laughs> and, I'm sorry. Uh, he frantically looks for his camcorder to amp up the spooky vibes. <laughs> I love analog horror, and this is what occurs. Accessing GBS properties, 101, WRAV, FM, radio station. Date of broadcast, December 13th, 1963. Segment, announcement of the National Access Initiative. Beginning playback. This is the latest and newest tape to come out of this channel as of this recording. So, now you're all up to date. Unfortunately, this one leaves us with a lot more questions than answers, so we're probably going to wait for a little while until we can actually get something substantial in the near future. But for now, let's talk about 009. It starts off with what seems to be an old news program from WRAV, talking about Lyndon B. Johnson's initiative to give eligible households a myriad of technology in order to further advance the progression of American living. Seems mundane at first, until you realize the people responsible for supplying these pieces of technology is Cineodyne. Newspapers flash up on screen showing former President Kennedy's disapproval of Cineodyne, and then later showing a blurb of his assassination, implying that the assassination was orchestrated by not only Cineodyne, but President Johnson as well. In fact, it's kind of flat out said, as later on in the tape, we actually hear a secret audio recording of the CEO of Cineodyne at the time explaining how they will, if not already have, killed President Kennedy. Kennedy didn't go for it. But you assured me he was available. Or was that just more of your bullshit? Huh? He's gonna fucking expose our whole plan for the NAI program. The meeting couldn't have gone worse. If that fucking Nick thinks he's gonna expose Simeon, he's got another thing coming. But we're not the only ones he's pissed off lately. After rejecting Operation Northwoods, and then that executive order involving the Federal Reserve, there are a lot of snakes in the grass. And it's about time that Kennedy got bit. It's made clear through the flashing surveillance footage that this whole setup of giving Americans technology in order to advance the progression of 
future living whatever is sort of bullshit and it's honestly just made to spy on american households for what can't really be made too clear as of this story and this is decades before the Greylock incident so it's really hard to say what the motivation was but aside from the flashes of people's homes we also get a flash of a red mass figure and another flash of a group of masked figures in the woods it's unknown what this could mean for all we know these could be the guys that snuck into everyone's homes and started kidnapping people were they part of that mass home invasion that occurred in berkshire county hmm i don't know finally the last segment of this video has to do with a thought form remember those that was a little while ago invading the home of a young child the young child in question being katie it doesn't seem like she's anyone noteworthy as of right now but katie does confirm that yes even children were involved in unit 13 aka project stargate i hear from your doctor's office place that i had to go to now this whole segment is actually beautifully done and well executed i'm not even going to show it I want y'all to actually experience it on your own. Anyways, the tape ends with a phone ringing and, well, that's all we have for now. There is a lot to unpack with all of these videos. And honestly, I omitted some details and some other visual stuff that I'd rather you guys experience on your own. The community is still very young and I honestly think the funnest part about is that even a word funnest i think the funnier part about exploring these kinds of analog horrors is well the community so it would be nice if everyone gave it a shot you watched it on your own come up with your own theories and make a comment on what you think happened in those videos and what it all could mean at the end but this series is still going on so many things are probably left in the shadows still and honestly i'm just excited to see what happens next this has become genuinely one of my favorite analog horror series in a long long time now i feel like i've said that in the past about a few other things that i've recently covered but i'm gonna be real here it's been a good fucking year for online horror content seriously but Greylock isn't like any other series i've seen well Actually, that's not true. It's like a lot of other series I've seen, but I can see that it's done on purpose and almost as if it's a love letter to analog horror as a whole. I mean, seriously, there's so much effort and love put into it. I can really see where they took inspiration with every single one of these videos. You can tell that this was made by massive fans of not only analog horror, but a fan of online horror culture in general. It's giving a little bit of everything. It's got clear inspirations from Local 58 to Marble Hornets, Gemini Home Entertainment, Mandela Catalog, Monument Mythos, SCPs, even stuff like Skinwalkers. Like, this has so many shades of inspirations from so many other projects, but it doesn't feel tacked on or lazily added as it sometimes feels with other projects that are also inspired by analog horrors that are super popular. I mean, it kind of makes sense. This is made by Rob Gavigan. He's the horror dude that's been making a career on YouTube for a long time now and has amassed over 3 million subs. Of course he knows what he's talking about. Of course he's a fan of this sort of dark, eerie shit. And of course he knows what he's doing. In fact, I didn't like this series at first solely because I thought it was just clearly inspired by all those series that I just listed and didn't really have its own footing. But I was immediately proven wrong when I actually sat down and watched the rest of the series because honestly, the lore is interesting and genuinely pretty freaky and at times downright scary. It's something I feel even jaded fans of analog horror can find appreciation with. It is well crafted, well done, the acting is surprisingly well done, the lengths that it has gone to just to be as authentic as possible is insane, and really, I just think this series deserves more of a chance than what it's currently pulling. I've said this so many times, but I wholeheartedly recommend you watch this series on your own if you're a fan of analog horror, and even if you were once a fan of that sort of media and you just sort of lost interest, I promise you, it is like the sloppiest and horniest love letter to online horror that I've seen in a while, and it stands on its own as a beautifully crafted and genuinely creepy piece of fiction. The playlist will be in the description down below. Check it out. Give Rob and Matt a kiss from me. 
preferably on the lips and on the forehead and on the top of the head where the but anyways enjoy the rest of the series as it continues to unfold Not Your Normal Kid Show is a YouTube series created by BVK, BLT, an up and coming content creator with a rather massive following on TikTok and Instagram. So I guess saying that they're an up and coming content creator is kind of a lie. I don't give a fuck. Anyways, the series stars a redheaded clown lady with her, I guess, friend named the Tall Man as she hosts this seemingly unnamed show. Though, we can't assume it's called Not Your Normal Kids Show, the fact is, this show has no real name to it. We're not even really sure what it's about. Sure, we have some of your basic stuff like doing your laundry, eating right, planting flowers, and not opening the door to strangers. But shit gets real fucked during each and every one of these episodes, such as the aforementioned plants turning into horrible zombie hands as the screen glitches, an occurrence that happens frequently that often changes the nature of the video itself, sort of like giving a glimpse of the true reality lurking underneath this facade of a clown fuckery. There does seem to be a sort of thinly veiled messaging with each of these videos, mainly pertaining to content creation and the thin line between creating and creator, but with this series being super new and with only eight episodes available, it's super hard to really pin down what the story is, if there even is one. But I'll try to dissect it as much as I can because I'm the illest and spookiest content creator around. To start off with this messy little dissection, we need to talk about the most prominent figure in this whole mess, which is our main clown gal, who has no name whatsoever. At least, it's not totally obvious what her name is, not until episode 6, where she finally reveals her real name in a very cryptic manner. Silly, you already know my name. See? It's pronounced... Translating this from Morse code, it means Dottie. Yeah, that probably should have been obvious by now, but hey, whatever. There are some things to note about Dottie. First of all, in all of these videos, she doesn't really seem all that enthused to be part of these shorts. While she has a smile on her face most of the time, we do have moments where she seems straight up frightened for her life. Her pupils shrink whenever she encounters certain things, such as spiders or a horrifying forest creature, showing that even Dottie is afraid of her surroundings, almost like she doesn't really want to be there. There are even points where her voice, while cheery at times, can have this sort of swallowed, almost agitated tone. Take a listen where she tells you that you're too early for the show to start, for example. starts at a specific time. You should remember that. Let's get started then, shall we? It's pretty sarcastic and kind of annoying. I, I think it's clear that she doesn't really enjoy making these shorts, almost like she's a prisoner in making these. That's made more clear with episodes like episode four, where the back of her head is shown to have another face, one that's deformed and looks almost tired looking with a strange dotted pupil. Almost like her vision is obscured, both figuratively and literally, especially since this face is, again, at the back of her head, covered by hair. But Dottie, of course, is not our only character, as we also have the creator of these shorts as well, that being BV Key, as they are one in the same. It's a character that she plays, not just in real life, but in this little series as well. In episode 2, we see BV Key in her room, alone, listening to music. This is when she hears a knock on the door, and is given a letter that reads, Let the Tall Man In. The Tall Man being another prominent character whom we'll talk about shortly, but for now, what's important to note is that the Tall Man is an oppressive figure that seems to loom over her life, and, at the end of this episode, seemingly kidnaps her. 
in the description, we can see that this is the origin story of this entire series, but the origin is still kind of unclear. However, if we explore the character of the tall man, we can get some answers as to what this whole series really is about, but explaining who he is is, well, tricky. It seems Dottie isn't really intimidated by the tall man himself, treating him as sort of a friend, but it's clear to us that tall man doesn't really treat Dottie the same way. He can sometimes be antagonistic, threatening even, usually when Dottie gets out of line or maybe even out of character. Sometimes the tall man is missing, and it's stated that you shouldn't let the tall man in. Though rather than asking who the tall man is, we should be asking what he represents. Because he doesn't really seem like he wants to kill or even seriously hurt Dottie, but it also seems like he's not a friend of hers either. If I had to make assumptions, I believe the tall man is more of a business partner to Dottie than anything. Now how did I get to that conclusion? Well, I think it's worth reading between the lines with this series. Again, I must reiterate that this is a young series. Things could change from here onwards as the series progresses. So I am interpreting the series with what I have now. And I think this series is all about content creation and the toxic nature of constant creativity. Now you can disagree and approach this series at its face value, but the way I see it, I think Dottie is a representation of people online who play characters, mask themselves as something that they're not. Even when said person doesn't really want to be that character or really feel like doing it anymore. Most importantly, I think it represents that dark and somewhat disturbing era of YouTube where kids' content was uncurated and mainly trash. I mean, yes, it's kind of still trash. In fact, mostly trash to this day. Not much has changed, but during that weird time where Elsa's Spider-Man shit was thriving, I think making kids content was just a much easier and fruitful endeavor for even lazy people. Kids were exposed to some heinous and gross shit out there. I mean, YouTube Kids app, like I said, still has some weird and sometimes unbelievable amount of shit just lurking around. It's very low effort and can really be traumatizing to some kids nowadays, but I, I think the messaging behind this is twofold. Not only is it a commentary on the shitty, sometimes horrific kids content people make today, but it's also a commentary of what content creators face when having to constantly talk about something new and creative. It drains you quite a bit, and I've discussed this earlier this month with a video I made. Yet sometimes you feel tethered, if not totally chained, by your work here, because you ain't got anywhere else to go. And that's why Dottie seems kind of like a hostage to the tall man who, with his business suit and very tall visage, represents the people who do business behind the scenes, the people upstairs. You know, those guys. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, whatever social media you dwell in and make your living on, you can expect that those kind of faceless entities just exist there and only care about one thing, and that's the content you pump out. They're not outright trying to destroy your channel or your chances at success, but they don't make it easier either. They hold you on a leash, making sure that you do make content, but they're also not friendly about it. When you cross that line, you're at risk of being in trouble, possibly facing termination. It's why we see the tall man abducting the creator of the series so that she's forced to make content whether she likes it or not. It's why Dottie has a tired look on her face, at least at the back of her head, because at the back of her mind, she's contemplating whether making this content is worth it. It's why that same face is veiled up by their hair and the eyes are dotted, because now the creator is literally blurring the lines between their character and their real life. It's why when you approach her without her knowing that you're there, she gets annoyed because she doesn't want you to see that part of her. Not only that, but there's also the creepier aspects of this whole series. The spooky little sun, the strange alarm clock, the awful spiders, they just seem really out of place and have pretty much no symbolic meaning whatsoever, at least not to me. But I think in my interpretation at least, I think this also represents what Dottie and in extension the creator really want to do. Sure, it's easier for them to make kids content, but I think these thoughts they have, these creepier aspects of their show that slowly eke their way into the series are just manifestations of what BV Key wants to make. She wants to be scary, she wants to be spookier, to the point where there are these glitches that sort of give you a glimpse of what she wants to do. 
There's even an interesting point in episode 7 where a wolf is approaching Dottie and she seems scared for her life and something is about to happen when the tall man appears and suddenly the wolf vanishes. The tall man being a manifestation of the more corporate side of these websites would obviously not want Dottie to make this sort of content because well, I don't know if you guys know this, but making creepy content on YouTube can be a fucking nightmare sometimes. Like guess what? Creepy content is sometimes violent and deals with dark subjects. Subject matter. So of course, that makes it a lot harder to monetize and sometimes these videos get suppressed. With that in mind, it's obviously more preferable for creators to make family friendly content so that it's easily monetized and discoverable, even if it is low effort and not exactly what most content creators want to do or make. Regardless though, this is what sells, so to speak, and reaching a wider audience as seen in episode 8 where Dottie is seen talking to a younger man who's up really late at night just watching TV. I think this episode represents a parasocial relationship one obtains when making this sort of content. I mean, most of us probably watch TikTok or YouTube shorts or even Twitter or I mean, I guess X, whatever, I don't give a fuck. We go to these websites or these apps right before we go to sleep, getting absorbed by nonsense and sometimes a certain person's content. We are absorbed with this person we don't know and start binging their stuff rather than actually going to sleep. I mean, it's definitely deep commentary, but again, I can't stress this enough. This is my interpretation. I could be looking at this way deeper than the creator intended. Maybe this really is just about a clown facing horrible nightmares in this horrible ghoulish world. Maybe it's about something else entirely. Or maybe there's a story buried within that that I just totally missed. Which of course leads me to one character that is seldom mentioned but definitely present, that being Mother. Mother baffles me a bit. I don't really know what she represents in my theory. She's a creature that has a strange diet and seems to scare Dottie quite a bit. In episode 5, Dottie is seen feeding her mother baby tomatoes, I, I don't know what they're actually called, and chicken, quote unquote, which is very clearly a carved face. In episode 7, we see Mother wearing that face very briefly. What this could mean or what Mother represents, I'm not really sure. Maybe she represents the hopes and dreams that she never got to accomplish. Maybe it represents a literal overbearing mother that wants to see her daughter succeed where she couldn't. Who knows? Honestly, much of the series' mysteries have been unsolved and there's a lot of clues and hints that I just didn't bother mentioning because they don't really make sense at the moment or because I feel like this would be a fun little channel to revisit sometime in the future, when it's actually complete that is. So, I encourage all of you to check out this series while it's still going, the links will be in the description, watch these yourselves, solve these riddles on your own, or with the small community that this has cultivated, and make sure to show the series some love. Because with the amount of attention and care given to the series so far, it's really obvious that there's so much work put into this. And honestly, I'm just glad I got to talk about something that's not an analog horror. Sorry, Greylock. I love you a ton, but only as a friend. Sorry. Even if it was, I, I feel like it'd succeed either way, this little series, because it's interesting, and it's got a lot of weird things about it that I really want to see flourish in the future. So, check it out.